Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, this will be, you got to get online. You get on the Zoom right now if you want to see it. <laughs> All right. So we have Jack joining us. I'm going to give him a second to connect. Then I'll send him into the audience. Hi, Jack. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute you and you'll bring you back for um, District 4. All right. Everybody ready? Okay, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is for our third of four elections forums that we're having for the uh, City of Oxnard 2020 election. And uh, we are starting this evening with District 3 candidates. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce them as well as our panelists who will be fielding our questions tonight. So our first person we have here who's running for District 3, his name is Mr. Ronald Arwejo. Then we have Mr. Oscar Madrigal and Mr. Aaron Starr. Hello. And the way this evening is going to work is that uh, we'll be doing two minutes of opening statements for our candidates. Then we'll have a Q&A portion. And at the end of this hour for this program, we will have uh, two minutes closing statements for each of them as well. Our panelists to, for this portion of the evening are going to be Mr. Alex Ray Rivera, Mr. Manuel Herrera, and Ms. Diana Vilsi. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And uh, with our opening statements, uh, just so you all know, uh, candidates, we are going to start in alphabetical order, but we will also be cycling you through. So um, for this portion, for your uh, opening statement, it'll be alphabetical order when we go to the Q&A. We'll um, cycle you all through so that everybody has a chance to go first and everybody has a chance to go last. All right. So we're going to first start with our two minute uh, opening statement from Mr. Ronald Arwejo. Thank Mr. you Arwejo. very much. Um, hello, Oxnard. My name is Ronald Arwejo and I'm running for Oxnard City Council. I was born and raised in South Oxnard, graduated from UCLA and Indiana University with a master's in public affairs and worked in the public sector in both local and federal governments since I graduated. I'm campaigning on three priorities, improving our infrastructure, working with local leaders, and investing in Oxnard's future. When I go out into the district, I'm always hearing that Oxnard streets are in a sad state of disrepair. Unfortunately, based on a 2019 report regarding Measure O funds, street maintenance and repairs only made up 13% of the total expenditures. It is clearly not a priority of this council if only one out of every eight dollars is spent on that and i will fight to make sure it is of higher importance measure e or not with a recently de approved development pack for the sacuoka farms development district three should have a prominent say on its development since it is entirely within the district using my experience working with the economic development workforce committee with the city of altoona wisconsin and on numerous projects when i was placed with not thomas p miller and associates an economic consulting firm. I am aware of the obstacles from both the local governments and potential businesses perspective. As councilman, I will proactively reduce the burden to all, whether it be time or money, in the development and sustainment of that 438 acres. Even with all the problems beset by Oxnard in the past, from financial and managerial mistakes, which we are still having to deal with, I am hopeful that Oxnard will still elect someone that will set up the foundation for an economic resurgence, utilize ideas already out there to fit the city's uniqueness, and effectively solve the biggest problems dragging the district down. Oxnard needs an infusion of new ideas to not only fix the problems of the past, but also to start investing in the future for its long-term prosperity. I look forward to further explaining my views on how to best invest in Oxnard's future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next candidate will be Mr. Oscar Madrigal. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oscar Madrigal, and I am uh, the current council member. I was elected to the city council in 2016. I was uh, born and raised here in the city of Oxnard. I have lived in La Colonia neighborhood uh, since the age of four. I am a product of this wonderful city as I attended uh, local public schools here in the area. I am a graduate of Channel Islands High School. I have a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in public policy and administration 
from California Lutheran uh, University. I have been a high school educator for the last uh, 13 years, giving back to our uh, future generations. Um, I am committed to working for a better future in our community. I am grateful every day to give back to this uh, city that has uh, given uh, so much uh, to me. As a city council member, I have um, always put the needs of the community first in all of my, um, in all of my decisions. Um, I have always pushed for the advancement of our city. Uh, over the last four years, I have demonstrated a strong commitment to the quality of life of this city. Um, I bring necessary experience, devotion, and knowledge to lead our city during these uncertain times. While the last four years have been tough for our city, 30 seconds. we have continued to progress. I will continue to work to ensure that the city of Oxnard is prioritizing our neighborhoods, delivering on our core necessary community services, our continued economic growth, and preserving our quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our third candidate will be Mr. Aaron Starr. Thank you. My name is Aaron Starr and I want to represent you on the City Council. Oxnard's seven member council is composed of two school teachers, a social security disability attorney, a retired postal worker, a retired city employee, a current city employee, and a state government worker. The City Council has no background in private industry and it shows. That's why their mindset is to increase taxes, not improve oversight and get more bang for the buck. Over the last two years, 536 agenda items have come before the council. The council voted unanimously more than 93% of the time, acting as rubber stamps for all of the city manager's proposals. If elected, I will bring another point of view to the table. I will use my 35 years of business and accounting experience to ensure your tax money is spent wisely serving the public. For nearly two decades, I have served as the financial controller of Haas Automation, employing over 1,400 people in high paying job, manufacturing jobs in Oxnard. I am committed to bringing more such jobs to our community, along with reform and innovation to Oxnard City Hall. You may have seen my wife and me in front of stores, farmers markets, or, or even at your door, gathering signatures to place four reform measures onto November's ballot. These measures demonstrate the types of policies I will advance as your representative open, transparent, accessible government that actually works, keeps its promises, and delivers quality services at an affordable cost. I support responsive government, transparency, seconds. accountability, and ethics, attracting and retaining local businesses and well-paying jobs, fixing streets and alleys and cleaning up parks, roadways, and public landscaping, protecting health and safety, addressing homelessness with support from the faith-based community, and better education for our children. I will be honored if you would vote for Aaron Starr for Oxnard City Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go into the Q&A portion and um, our first question will be taken by Mr. Alex Ray Rivera. And the order will start again alphabetical and then we'll start shuffling people through. So it'll be the order, uh, Mr. Arwejo, Mr. Madrigal, and then Mr. Starr. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Gabe. All right, uh, District 3, let's go. Uh, we're going to start with Ronald. What is your number one priority for District 3, and how do you plan to accomplish it? My number one priority is what I've always stated, what the residents want, what the district wants, about improving our infrastructure, particularly improving this roads and road repair. You know, um, for example, uh, the city council has not had a long-term view of everything that it's been doing. The improved mobility options along a 28 mile stretch of Highway 101 from Ventura County to Thousand Oaks is currently being studied right now, led by the Ventura County Transportation Committee. Having attended some of the public input meetings just last year as a member of the public, it is incumbent upon the next council person to make sure that Del Norte Boulevard will be expanded in a way that accounts for the expanded capacity from the just approved Sakioka Farms development. Building that infrastructure won't just be because of Oxnard, but in partnership with the county and other cities. In addition to my other two priorities, seconds. 
of working with local leaders, working with the other cities and of the county, and always looking at actions and decisions, not just in my term, uh, my first term, but look not of the four years, but of 40 years. We should not be looking at quick band-aid solutions. We should be looking at the long-term investment, and that includes all the entities in Ventura County and from one to 40 years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, next, same question, Oscar, what is your number one priority for District 3? How do you plan to accomplish it? Uh, the biggest priority for District 3 and probably one of the top one to three priorities in the city is uh, Sakioka Farms and um, what can be there at Sakioka Farms and what it will bring not only to District 3 uh, but to the city as a whole. Um, Sakioka Farms is our big opportunity uh, to um, increase revenue in the city, uh, to bring well-paying jobs to the city, uh, to bring uh, business to the city. So it's, um, it's a big economic development opportunity. Uh, when we passed the original Sakioka Farms um, agreement, um, in it, it does state that um, the Del Norte Bridge actually is gonna get revamped. So it will actually be widened in the um, near future. And also, you know, we have to look at other particular things, including housing. Uh, we are probably going to have um, 30 two, big housing, two big housing developments in the you know, next four to five years, uh, being in the Colonia neighborhood uh, with uh, the new apartments and in East Village uh, housing that'll be behind uh, the new high school. So those are all things that we have to take into account. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Aaron, uh, same question. Do you need me to repeat it? No, I think I know what it is. Okay, go ahead. So we really need to take care of the basics. Uh, the city does not perform well at the basics. We don't have good enough roads. The landscaping is not taken care of. We need to clean up the trash in the city. Uh, we need to have uh, law enforcement that's adequate. We need to figure out a way to provide public services at a more affordable cost instead of raising taxes during a pandemic. And the way you have to do that is, number one, you need to figure out other ways to bring revenue in. You need to attract jobs and businesses. Uh, my 35 years of experience in business and accounting and being the financial controller of the largest manufacturer in the area makes me well suited for this. I'm a big advocate of Measure L, which will bring transparency to our spending at City Hall so we can see that the money is being, how it's being spent and figure out how it can be spent better. 30 seconds. I'm also a big advocate of Measure F, which will introduce permit simplicity into Oxnard. We need to be able to bring more businesses into town. And one of the big hangups is that businesses are delayed uh, from opening here because we have a permit system that is completely broken. So that's the bottom line, bring in more money, uh, bring in more businesses, focus on spending our money better so we get more bang for the buck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Our next question will be taken by Ms. Diana Velsi, and the order will be Mr. Madrigal, followed by Mr. Starr, followed by Mr. Arwejo. Diana, you were on mute. Of course. Uh, uh, hi, I hope everyone is doing well tonight. What do you think needs to be done to fully address homelessness in the city? Mr. Madrigal? Uh, thank you for um, your question. Uh, the big thing with homelessness is that housing does need to be provided. If not, you know, we're, we will be on the same course that we've been on for the last, you know, five years or so of you know, going from encampment to encampment, moving uh, uh, homeless individuals from one area of the city to the next. Uh, housing um, for many years as viewed as the final reward, but long-term, you know, it has to be seen as the initial reward, you know, uh, providing someone housing, uh, basic need, you know, will make their life better. And, you know, hopefully, you know, it gives them motivation to go out, get a job, improve um, 
their life, you know, because for some people, it's, you know, temporary aspect of being homeless, you know, you lose a job, you might be three weeks away from being homeless. So the aspect, of, the aspect of providing um, housing should be uh, brought up first. And that is something that we started uh, working on within the city. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Starr, thank you. Thank you. Well, I can tell you what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't build a five-story, $34 million building in downtown on a half-acre lot. That's not going to help. It's going to destroy downtown. We're going to have a lot of homeless people congregating in one place. It's just going to cause a real problem. A lot of damage to property will become a slum. Most homeless programs, candidly, are not designed to actually fix the problem. They really become a career path for the folks that are working there. And the goal is to keep the money flowing and perpetuate the existence of the program to maintain income for the program employees. I believe that we need to do more to include the not-for-profit and faith-based community in, as for the solution. And what I would propose is something more along the line of a success-based bounty for each person that uh, a not-for-profit or church can actually get off the streets and into a functional life. We need to treat the homeless problem is a, it's a serious problem. We have, it's a serious health problem. 30 seconds. We have folks defecating in the streets. We have needles everywhere. It's causing serious damage to other people's property and it's creating health hazards for people just trying to run their everyday lives. So we really must treat it for what it is. It is a, it's a public health problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arroyo. Yes, Mr. Arwell, yes, correct. Uh, um, sorry. No problem, no worries. Um, yeah, so research shows that homelessness is primarily because of one or more of the following three reasons. One, drugs, alcohol, or mental health. Two, economic reasons. And three, they're content with their current situation. With regards to the first reason that I stated, the city cannot take up the entire burden of the county. Ventura County has the resources and the capacity with regards to treating drug and alcohol abuse and addiction and mental health issues. One of the current members on council will eventually be on the board of supervisors. And so I hope that they will take on that responsibility with the city's assistance. In relation to economic reasons, there will be a new neighborhood surrounding the soon to be built Del Sol High School. This is a prime opportunity to rebalance affordable housing priorities and give some people on the lower end of the income scale a chance at owning a home a duplex, or just get their own apartment. 30 seconds. Unfortunately, this council has dropped the ball in approving development projects that cater more to the working class. I'm not saying that this neighborhood will be a panacea for all problems regarding homelessness, but it will definitely tackle it more than this past council has. Thank you. Game. Thank you very much. Our next question will be taken by Mr. Uh, Manuel Herrera. And the order will be Mr. Starr, followed, followed by Mr. Arwejo, followed by Mr. Madriga. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Starr, so yes. this first question, uh, your answer is probably going to be obvious, but the question is, of the five local ballot measures, which do you support and which do you oppose? Okay. <laughs> No on E and yes on the other four. Uh, measure E will double our city sales tax rate from 1.5% to 3%, making Oxnard the highest city tax rate in California during a pandemic when Oxnard families and small businesses can least afford it. And Measure E's taxes go to the city's general slush fund with no guarantees on how politicians spend the money. Measure F fixes City Hall's broken bureaucracy by streamlining the permit process, helping Oxnard attract high paying jobs, increasing revenues without raising taxes, build housing that's affordable, and bring more retail stores to Oxnard so we can shop locally. Uh, Measure L requires that all invoices be posted online, performance metric for city departments, internal audits of city operations, and requires that wrongful and criminal acts be reported to the city council and law enforcement. It puts the city finance department under the direction of a city treasurer elected by and accountable to the people of Oxnard. Measure M will make council meetings more accessible to seconds. residents. It requires city council meetings to be held at times when members of the public can actually attend and participate after 5 p.m. work days. 
Measure N says the city should fix the streets and only charge us their half cent sales tax if they actually do the work they promised. You only get a paycheck if you do the work. Uh, that same standard should apply to the city. The better way to improve Oxnard is to vote no on Measure E, Measure E's tax increase, and yes on the citizen sponsor report measures F, L, M, and N. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Arwejo. Thank you. I don't know about the author of Measure M, but I actually worked in city government. I regularly make presentations to council and committees, and it would have been a disaster to the city staff and a detriment to transparency and accountability for the citizens. Information is updated and inputs from both the staff and the public help to adjust the presentation so that it is more relevant and consequential to the residents. Why would we want to restrict how the city council works? Should we not be providing the maximum flexibility in governing to meet changing needs? Regarding E, I am reluctantly voting for it, not because I want to raise taxes, but because Oxnard needs the resources to both fix the problems of the past and start on a better footing for the future. Our streets have not been prioritized by both past and current council members, and I will use my vote to prioritize the funding and schedule to make it happen. I'm willing to make the tough votes so that our streets are maintained. With just the 63 out of 100 square for our roads, with me on council, E will only increase it. Another measure and proposed, on the other hand, will stop even the option of measure all funds going to roads. Vote for better roads, vote yes on E and no on N. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Madrigal. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the biggest one or the only one that I would vote yes on is uh, Measure E. Um, it is uh, much needed in the city. As anyone can tell the last two to three years, uh, things are looking rough out there uh, with our medians, our parks, our streets. And the only way uh, to get where we're at, uh, the only way to improve would be through Measure E. Uh, we need uh, better, um, we need more uh, public safety officers, both in fire and police to improve our uh, neighborhoods. And all that can be done through uh, Measure E. Uh, we, need, we need more youth services. Uh, we need to provide uh, more community services, more of the arts to the city or to our residents. And that is what uh, Measure E will do. Um, on the other hand, um, 30 seconds. Th the one uh, that I'll focus on would be uh, Measure L. Uh, the thing is, anyone can run for that particular office and win. And that could cause chaos uh, throughout the city. Um, obviously, uh, Mr. Starr is, you know, a bright man when it comes to financing. Um, if he were running for treasurer, if this were to pass and you were running for treasurer, okay. If we have and any your other time person, has expired, we, Mr. Madrigal. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Gabe, Gabe, real quick, um, just for clarification, uh, do you mind if we ask uh, Mr. Ornejo and Madrigal uh, which are yes and which are no? I think they, they didn't mention all of them. Um, is that okay? That, let's go ahead and move on. It. Just Yeah, I think I heard it. Yeah, um, and okay. that time has expired also um, for the time they had allotted. So I appreciate the question, but we should move on. Okay. All right. There will I be time it. to address others later. So thank you. I got it, Gabe. Um, this next question, we're going to start with uh, Ronald. Uh, there's uh, been a lot of national discussion about the uh, defunding or reallocating of police budgets to fund other social services. And uh, in Oxnard, there has been so, some discussion. Um, can you tell us your thoughts on this and, and uh, the funding levels uh, specific to Oxnard PD? Certainly. Um, I believe that we need to ensure that public safety keeps everyone safe. It is important for the police to have the tools and resources needed while keeping them accountable to the people. The policies and the budgetary priorities should reflect the growth of our city and should similarly be affected in funding restrictions. Oxnard wants and needs a police force that will fulfill their primary responsibility of public safety. In order for Oxnard to become and remain a vibrant city, it needs a safe city. I'm not opposed to reallocating budget priorities to better reflect the personnel and technologies available for public safety. 
For example, Oxnard didn't have the intelligent analytics such as heat mapping to determine the most probable days, times, and areas for crimes from just a few years ago. However, that technology is available for us. I believe these examples are a good investment in the long-term safety of Oxnard and its residents. We can't just be cutting for cutting sakes, but when I look at the budget line by 30 line, seconds. I will be urging council to better substantiate the reasons to the voters and taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Councilman Madrigal, the same question, would you like me to repeat it? Uh, uh, no, that's uh, fine. Uh, I got it. Thank you, Thank you though. Um, when it comes to the police department, um, I think there's one thing we could all agree on is that, you know, everybody wants to feel safe. At the end of the day, uh, that's where uh, the line is. Everybody wants to feel safe. Uh, the police department, you know, in a way, it, do they have a large percentage of the, of the general budget? Yes. Uh, for the size of the city, is the police budget kind of low? Yes. Um, we have to look at uh, things um, that work. Community policing is a great way uh, to keep the community safe. It's a great way to build trust in the community. Uh, that is gonna cost some money. Uh, many residents are asking for better training uh, from the police department. That's gonna cost uh, money as well. Um, if we begin to cut for cutting sake, 30 seconds, we are gonna be in trouble, not only for the present, but for the future of the city. Uh, we'll have long lasting problems if we begin to cut uh, police funding. Thank you, sir. Aaron Starr, same question. Do you, do you need me to repeat that OPD? Go ahead, please repeat it. Okay, great. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, national discussion about defunding or reallocating uh, police budgets to fund other social services. And uh, there's been questions about OPD funding levels. What are your thoughts on this specific to Oxnard? Well, first of all, with any city, uh, public safety, law enforcement is the highest priority. It just simply is. There's everything else is pretty much secondary because uh, if you're not safe, nothing else really matters. Having said that, you know, when I go shopping, I go to Costco, not Whole Foods. And not everything at Costco is a good deal. I want the residents to get the possible deal on any public service. So when I look at the cost of law enforcement and other communities, I want to understand how can some uh, communities do provide that service at a lower cost. So if you look at, for example, at Port Wainimi, Camarillo, Thousand Oaks, and Simi Valley, the lowest cost city per capita is Thousand Oaks. It's $253 per capita uh, for police protection. And the highest among those four is Port Wainimi at $311. It's not really clear exactly how much of our budget seconds. is being spent in Oxnard on police. We know that total public safety is winding up to be about $525 per capita uh, for police and fire combined. But if we can assume that roughly three out of four dollars in Oxnard on public safety is spent on police rather than fire, we're still spending about $393 per capita, which is a lot more than other cities. So we need to ask, for example, the Ventura County Sheriff, how they're able to deliver service at a lower cost. Your time has expired, Mr. Starr. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our next question will be by Ms. Diana Velsi, and the order is Mr. Madrigal, followed by Mr. Starr, followed by Mr. Arwejo. And you're on mute, Ms. Velsi. Sorry about that. Um, Council Member Madrigal, what do you plan to do to ensure residents of La Colonia and Rose Park feel as equally represented as those from the more affluent neighborhoods in your district? Um, well, first, um, I've been a resident of La Colonia for the last uh, 32 years. And, you know, it's a long standing. Um, you know, uh, mindset or uh, concept that, you know, since the neighborhood was built in the early 1900s, that it was the other people on the other side of the tracks. Uh, that being said, you know, I remember being six years old. I remember being at Del Sol Park 
uh, looking over Camino de la Raza, not Camino del Sol, and seeing nothing but strawberry fields there. Uh, there was no West Village or East Village, and there was no Walmart. So I remember that uh, very vividly in my childhood. Uh, that being said, you know, it's uh, being a part of the community. I've attended, you know, nearly before COVID, nearly uh, every month, the Rose Park neighborhood meeting. I know their concerns. I know the issues at 30 Rose seconds. Park. Um, I've celebrated uh, with them. I've also had discussions with them on things that may or may not work. Uh, same thing in La Colonia. Uh, be it neighborhood cleanups, I'm there. Be it whatever the event is, I'll try my best to be there. Is it um, a celebration? I'm there to serve. Is it a cleanup? I'm there to work. Uh, that being the case, it's just being there and knowing that you care is the biggest thing. Thank you. Mr. Starr, you're, uh, you're could you please, could you please repeat that question so I'm clear on it? Yeah. What do you plan to do to ensure the residents of La Colonia and Rose Park feel as equally represented as those from the more affluent uh, neighborhoods in your district? I think it's very important to be able to listen to people, I always have an open door policy. And you know, we need to come in with an attitude that we need to treat people with respect and recognize that we as human beings are all, all children of God. And we need to deal with certain system inequities that we have today. And that's actually most evident in our public schools. Uh, we're not adequately preparing our children to succeed in today's world, especially when it comes to math, which is fundamental to obtaining careers in engineering, computer programming, and other higher paying fields. Uh, to some extent, the uh, private industry has been stepping up uh, to fill the gap by providing on the job training. And but I believe that as a city, we can do more uh, to resolve these inequities by working with the school system. Uh, they definitely need to uh, teach skills that employers want so we can tell them what uh, skills our uh, potential employers are seeking. And by doing this, uh, our children will be able to afford to live here instead of leaving 30 seconds. elsewhere. Uh, we need to offer everybody uh, a ladder to, to overcome inequity, to climb out of uh, poverty and realize the American dream. So we really need to uplift everybody, including in those neighborhoods. We just, we want everyone to have the potential to do really well. I love it when people do well. I love it when they do really, really well. So um, I'm very, very supportive of that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Araijo? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, so I have lived in South Oxford for most of my life, um, but just in the last few years, I've been here heavily involved in a leadership position with the East Village Neighborhood Council. And what I tell people in La Colonia and Rose Park and in Rio Lindo and West Village is that I may not know your issues right now, but I will put the devoted time and effort that I have with the East Village neighborhood um, that I do with the entire district. Um, I will be making sure to be working with all the local leaders, which goes hand in hand with my second priority. That doesn't just include the business leaders, that doesn't just include the state and federal leaders, that also includes all the community and civic leaders. My goal right now in the campaign is to at least touch every address twice in this district in some form or fashion. When I go through La Colonia and Rose Park, they may see the incumbent sometimes, but they don't see any actions coming from it. And they look at the other neighborhoods and say, what is happening with us? 30 seconds. I think there has to be more transparency, more accountability, and definitely more communication. If if the residents know why something isn't happening, at least let them know why. Um, so what I have done for East Village, I, with the passion that I've showed, I will do for the entire district. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you all very much. Our next question will be uh, by Mr. Manuel Herrera and the order will be Mr. Starr, followed by Mr. Arwejo, followed by Mr. Madrigal. Thank you. The following concerns or questions have been posed by members of the public regarding your candidacy. Mr. Starr, you had stated at last week's public forum and then on numerous social media platforms about the city's per capita cost for public safety. It has been stated that the presented figures were not a true apples to apples comparison. Some members of the public have alleged this is a pattern of behavior to mislead the public. 
How do you respond to this? Well, first of all, your question contains a premise, which isn't true. Uh, what I said was that questions need to be asked and I didn't have all the answers. Uh, so I'm not gonna apologize for asking questions. The business might approach to, prob to problem solving is to ask questions. You dig out the data and then you make decisions. And even if additional data should be added to the equation, data which was not disclosed in the cappers, the substance of what I said is still correct. It costs more for police services in Oxnard than in other cities. What the objectors are saying is that some of the other cities' fire costs don't show in the city's cappers, but are instead part of the property taxes and paid directly to the county. But even if you exclude the fire costs from Oxnard, which seems to be about three to one ratio for police to fire, there is still an issue with the per capita cost for police services in Oxnard relative to other cities. I cited my sources for where I got the data. Additional data that has 30 seconds on social media does not cite any sources for the public to go verify it. I have no way of confirming the numbers being alleged on social media. I think it's a fair question. But Mr. Stark, what the me, price ought to be for a basic service. We need to understand who gets the biggest bang for the buck so that we can emulate them. That's what, yeah, that's what I get to answer. I, that's what this is all about. Let's allow them to answer manual. It's about making sure that we get the biggest bang for the buck. And I think it's reasonable to ask those sorts of questions. But it, it wasn't a question, it was an accusation. And this wasn't the only time. You also had posted on the 26th of September, you, uh, you titled it Secret, Salary, Secret Salaries at Oxnard City Hall. And you had claimed that they failed to, uh, to inform the state of the particular employee salaries and wages. And yet that wasn't the case. So it's, it, do you see why they think it's misleading? Okay, so if, if there's no question, uh, Mr. Edda, we're going to go ahead and move I, on. I, I, think, I think that if you're going to ask a question, I should simply have the opportunity to answer. I don't think it's fair to throw out a charge like that. Uh, we're, you're giving everybody a minute so, and a half to answer questions. So are we just going to allow people to make charges unanswered like that? I appreciate that, uh, that sentiment, Mr. Starr, and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next candidate's question. Okay, uh, Mr. So Edda, we have... Really, let's just be really clear that that was an unfair, Thank you, Mr. Starr. unfair dig at people. You should Thank you very much. I, I have addressed that as a moderator. I'm going to ask you to allow me to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Herrera, we're going to Mr. Arruejo now. Okay, Mr. Arruejo. Some have stated a perception that you are new to local politics and not been as visibly involved in the community. What is your response to this? Well, actually, that sounds like a perfect question to answer. Unfortunately, that question doesn't apply to me. I not only have political experience, I have the right kind of political experience. When I was very involved with UCLA student government, I had the opportunity to make the case on behalf of students by conversing with the power players of the UC system, mainly the state legislators in Sacramento and sometimes our representatives in Congress. Issues such as lowering tuition and fees on students, providing services to increase retention and ensuring access to the best university system in the world. These are ideals that I want to bring to Oxnard City Council of lowering costs for residents, improving services for the district, and making sure that Oxnard has the housing, infrastructure, and recreation to incentivize others to come and stay in this great city. With the city of Altoona, I first hand saw how decisions by the county and by the state, that being Eau Claire and Wisconsin, both positively and negatively affected the city. Ensuring seconds. communication among all relevant entities on any project lines up perfectly with my priorities to work with local leaders. I will be bringing the same attitude of collaboration on council, which is vital on getting anything done. And I think, to be honest, I think council needs a fresh new perspective, someone with a new voice and someone who is not going to be um, tied down to past practices that unfortunately both of the other candidates are. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mr. Madrigal, given you are the incumbent and many residents have expressed frustration with the current council's performance, why do you feel that the voters should consider you for a second term? Um, thank you uh, for your question. As with anything, um, we are all, everyone on council is their own individual. At the same time, though, um, we are judged as a unit. You know, be it, everyone on council has different opinions. Um, we all respect our opinions, but um, we 
are all different. But at the same time, no matter what we say in public or private, we're all tied together. We're all the current council. Uh, that being said, um, I've shown over the last four years that I'm willing to do what's best for the city. city. I am willing to, you know, not supposedly go with the crowd. You know, I'm willing to take a stand and, you know, either vote yes or no on something that, you know, ultimately will pass or not pass. I'm willing to be the decision to vote. Um, also, I'm willing to put in the work, not only in uh, District 3, but throughout the city. I've attended half of the neighbor, close to near half of the neighborhood councils in the last four years. I know that, you know, I'm a representative of District 3, but at the same time as a council member, you are representative of the entire city of Oxnard. You're there for the needs of all residents in the city, not just uh, those in District 3. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you okay. all very much. Thank you. Our next question will be uh, taken by Mr. Alex Ray Rivera, and it'll be Mr. Arwejo, followed by Mr. Madrigal, followed by Mr. Starr. Hey, thanks, Gabe. Uh, Ronald, you get to lead us off again on this one. So District 3 has uh, many potential sites for a retail cannabis business. What are your thoughts on this industry um, in Oxnard? Do you think um, higher uh, fees and taxes will slow sales and push it somewhere else? Yes, um, this topic, unfortunately, is another area in which Oxnard has fell behind its neighboring cities. While Oxnard wasted away its chance to be the first and it, because it's the largest city to create an environment to cash in on revenues and what this city manager has turned a lottery win for both the companies and the cities, we have watched Port Wainimi break in the funds through planned and responsible developer agreements and have basically recoup the decreases on their reserves. In just a three year period, the city has gotten at least three and a half million dollars in revenues. Now, I'm glad that Oxnard has moved even if very slowly, to allowing dispensaries in the city. It is unfortunate that after many years of watching Port Wainimi conduct their cannabis business, the council still has not agreed on what to do with these revenues. Why was it only a 1% donation of gross receipts for yet to be determined services? If Oxnard is giving this lottery um, and with 50 businesses wanting just 10 spots, council should have already seconds. decided what services for the youth, the homeless population, and my first priority on roads, et cetera, that the donation would have funded. Port Wainimi had a 5% of gross receipts value in their developing agreement, since recently decreased to 2%. Why is Oxnard not good enough at the 2% level too? Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Councilman Madrigal, uh, can you give us your thoughts on retail cannabis and Oxnard, the locations, and do you think that the go slow approach has cost Oxnard money especially when we go fast on other initiatives? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, the go slow approach as was decided uh, early 2017 um, has been quote unquote slow, it has been slow. Um, however, um, we have quite uh, the advantage once business does start up. We have the 101 freeway. Uh, we have the 101 freeway, anyone driving through it, quick stop, you know, and right there we have District 3. We have um, Del Norte, we have Rice, we have the Rose Exit. We have an opportunity uh, to bring uh, business uh, to those shopping centers in those particular areas. Uh, this, uh, in a way, not to be mean to Port Wainimi, but in fact, we could probably take them out of business simply because uh, people will no longer have to drive all the way into Port Wainimi. They could just drive right off the freeway, get off, do the business that they need to seconds. do, and get back and get back on the freeway. Um, in a way, this is going to be, you know, money for the cannabis businesses. Uh, this is going to bring much needed revenue to the city, although it's not going to be, you know, something that's going to take us out of the hole all on its own, but it's going to be a much needed help to um, revenues in the city. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron, District 3 has some excellent sites for retail cannabis. Can you tell us your thoughts on that industry as a potential revenue generator for our city? Do you support it? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, 
you know, the city's been using a go slow approach with this. Unfortunately, the city uses a go slow approach with just about everything. So that's one of the reasons why we don't get our roads fixed. It's one of the reasons why Sakioka Farms took over 10, 12 some odd years to get approved. This go slow approach has cost residents dearly. I'm also not a really big fan of how the city is approaching uh, this, uh, this subject there. I'm not a fan of preferential policies when it comes to issuing licenses. I think it's better to use zoning to determine whether a particular type of business belongs at a particular location. And once you introduce these subjective standards that allow staff to pick and choose who gets licenses, you're just creating an environment for corruption and cronyism, and particularly in a high profit business such as cannabis. I believe in more competition, which will bring down the price of cannabis, which is important for poor people who use cannabis for pain management and and other medical treatments. Um, 30 seconds. Thank you. I believe that as far as the 1% that they're extracting, uh, which I think they want to direct to homeless programs, I believe that those businesses should decide for themselves which charities that they think are worthy, not what the city thinks is. I think it's even legally questionable for them to direct the money that way. It sort of becomes a de facto city tax, and a, which I think would need to be approved by voters. And Anything that's a regulatory fee, it needs to be based on the cost of administering the program. They can't really charge this the way they want to do this, I don't think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our final question for this evening before closing statements will be uh, given by Ms. Diana Vilsi. And the order will be Mr. Madrigal, followed by Mr. Starr, followed by Mr. Arwejo. And you're on mute, Ms. Vilsi. I'll get used to that tonight. <laughs> um, well, I, it has been said that sometimes candidates only show up during election time, then disappear after the election only to reappear for the next election. If you don't get elected, what are you planning to do to continue helping our community? In your case, um, reelected. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, if I am not reelected, um, well, one, I'll still uh, be a teacher, uh, but two, um, I'll still be doing um, my civic service and helping out uh, my neighborhood, La Colonia, uh, helping out uh, down at Rose Park and, you know, helping out throughout the city in what, whichever way I can help out in. Um, for many years, you know, I was born and raised here. Uh, I want to give back. I know what it is, you know, that parents didn't, you know, couldn't afford the bills and the power gets cut off. I completely know that growing up. So I know how tough it was um, when you are told that you can't do something. And, you know, um, I know what it is to be a first generation, not only graduate of college, but graduate of high school. So I completely understand that. And I want to give back not only uh, to my community, but to the youth. I want them to, you know, 30 seconds, doing something better that something positive can and will be done here in the city of Oxnard, be it at City Hall or just be it out in regular everyday life out on the streets, you know, positive things or positive people, good people come out of the city of Oxnard. And that's uh, something that I'll continue to work on, be it if I'm on council or if I'm not on council. Thank you. Mr. Starr? Can you please repeat that one more time? Thank you. It has been said that sometimes candidates only show up during election time, then disappear after the election, only to reappear for the next election. If you don't get elected, what are, your, what are you planning to do to continue helping our community? Well, certainly no one's ever accused me of going away after an election. <laughs> so the first time I ran was in 2014, and I sat, started an organization called Moving Oxnard Forward to uh, move... Uh, our city forward. I wound up uh, battling the city over uh, egregious wastewater rate increases. Uh, ran again in 2016. I've been uh, involved with getting several ballot measures qualified for the ballot, including one to uh, repeal the wastewater rate increase. Uh, I show up at city council meetings. Uh, I, I, give, uh, I give my opinion. I talk to other folks trying to find out what they think needs to be done to make a better city. So I'm, I'm not the type to, to leave. It's just not in my nature. I'm the type that uh, gets involved uh, yes, wherever I am. 
and people have recognized me for that. And I think that uh, uh, we have a bright future in this city and I want to be part of it, whether it's on the council. 30 seconds. Or not. So uh, I don't think you have to worry about me going away. Uh, I'm here to stay and I, my wife and I are committed to making Oxnard the best possible place, uh, even if it's from the sidelines. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Arroga? Yes, of course I'm running the campaign to win, but I told one of my endorsers, the East Village Neighborhood Chair, that no matter what, I will be involved with the East Village. Um, I have been for the last three to four years and I will for um, as long as I live here in the neighborhood. When I was in Wisconsin um, working for the city, um, I was an assistant catechist for the uh, local parish there for the year and a half that I was there. And also um, to have a little fun, I joined the curling club there, which unfortunately we don't have here because there's not that much snow and ice. Um, when I was a graduate student in Indiana, um, I helped tutor math students at Bloomington High School South. Um, so no matter where I go, um, I uh, hope to be very involved with the community that I'm in. One of the reasons actually, even though I love Altoona so much that I tried to come back to California, since my dad is not in the best of health. And so hopefully after and before this campaign, the balance of my time- 30 seconds. After being on council, hopefully, and if not, um, will be to make sure that I'm there um, to help him to rehabilitate. And so um, family is really important to me and also the community. No matter what, um, I'll be involved. I just might not be in the newspaper every other week. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you very much. We're going to now move into our closing statements for the evening and each candidate will have two minutes. And the order for this uh, will be Mr. Starr followed by Mr. Arwejo, followed by Mr. Madrigal. Mr. Starr, you have two minutes for your closing statement. Thank you. Well, first I just want to quickly address uh, an accusation that was made earlier. I included a link to a state website affirming what I said now, if the state made a mistake instead of me, fine. But now the city says that they did file, but it wasn't a compliant filing. So I don't know if that's even much better. They have not explained how it was not compliant and why in three months the city has not fixed it. So first of all, I wanna thank you for attending uh, this evening. I'd like to give you a little more background on me. I've lived my entire life in Ventura County and my wife and I feel blessed to live in Oxnard with its rich history and wonderful people. I'm the oldest of three sons. My mother's a retired nurse. My father's a retired pharmacist. They've been happily married for over 58 years. Uh, both of my parents understood the importance of education and taught me the value of hard work. They told me to keep my word, do what's right, treat people fairly and with respect, and that working together, we're smarter than any one of us ever will be working alone. My wife and Alicia and I live frugally. We save our money and we stay out of debt. I, drive a 2004 Honda Accord with 240,000 miles on it. We don't own a beach house or take fancy trips. Uh, we live in a modest house in the East Village neighborhood right behind St. John's Hospital. And Oxnard's our extended family. We want each member of our family to have a fulfilling life and a bright future, which is why we invest so much of our time and personal resources into helping our city. As I mentioned earlier, I believe in open, seconds. transparent, accessible government that actually works, keeps its promises, and delivers quality services and affordable uh, costs. So before you automatically vote for the incumbent, ask yourself this. Has the city council accomplished anything noteworthy during these last four years? Are the roads better here than in other cities? Are fewer homeless people on the streets? Are employers offering better paying jobs that's got coming to town? I offer a diversity in thought, a set of skills and accomplishments no one else is running for office here. I will listen Thank to you. Your time has expired, Mr. Thank Starr. You. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Mr. Arwejo, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to thank the city of Oxnard and the INCO for hosting this forum. As someone who has been actively involved with the East Village Neighborhood Council for many years, this forum is an extension of why I got more involved to provide a service to my fellow neighbors. I have been humbled at the amount of support, both financial and otherwise, that I have received in just a couple of months. It is awe-inspiring to not only be recognized for what I can bring to Oxnard by my family and friends throughout the state and country, but by numerous residents within the city and this district. Oxnard needs a fresh new voice, unencumbered by the dated practices of the past 
willing and ready to work with fellow council members and always looking for ways to invest in Oxnard's short and long-term future to improve our infrastructure, work with local leaders and invest in Oxnard's future. Please read more about my platform on our wehelforoxnard.com or follow me on my social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I thank you for your time and respectfully ask that you vote for Ronald or Wehel for Oxnard City Council to invest in Oxnard's future. And if you're trying to look for my name on the ballot, it's the first name listed and hopefully I'll be your first choice too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Madrigal, you have two minutes for your closing statement. Uh, thank you to everyone who helped uh, with this candidate forum. It is uh, much appreciated. Uh, thank you to everyone who is uh, watching either via Facebook Live or is on the Zoom call. Um, I am 36 years old. I was born and raised here in the city of Oxnard. You know, I'm a high school teacher for the last, or a high school educator for the last 13 years. Um, I was actually the last citywide elected city council member. I've um, attended uh, the neighborhood council meetings. I've uh, volunteered within our, uh, within the community. I've uh, continued to fight uh, for economic growth in uh, the city. I've continued to fight for more youth services. Um, I have been endorsed uh, by the Oxnard uh, Chamber of Commerce. I've been endorsed by SEIU uh, 721, by the Central Coast Labor Council, by Local 585, by the Ventura County Democratic Central Committee, uh, by the Good Club, uh, by, uh, by the Ventura County Young Democrats, by the Oxnard Peace Officers Association, and uh, the Cause Action Fund. I have also been endorsed uh, by uh, Council Member uh, Bert Perello, uh, Mayor Candidate uh, Deidre Frank, and Community Advocate and um, District 3 resident uh, Miguel Rodriguez. Seconds who has done a tremendous job uh, with uh, feeding the front line, which is a wonderful thing that has been going on throughout uh, this pandemic, uh, just to name a few. I am humbly asking for your vote on November 3rd, uh, but more importantly, I am pleading that you go out and vote in general. Many people have given uh, their lives for the opportunity for us to vote. So please exercise that uh, given right. Thank you. You're Time is expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Madrigal. And I want to thank all three of our candidates for the District 3 race for uh, joining us this evening. If we were in person, this would be the point where I would invite the audience to give us some applause so we can um, use our imaginations on that. I'm sure they're clapping at home now. And thank you all very much. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to transition into the District 4 race. And so we're just going to take a quick break, just a, two or three minutes. One thing I want to mention is that um, we have some questions that we didn't get to this evening for District 3. Would our candidates be willing to have us send these to you? And you would send them back to us, and we will post it online for the public to review. OK, I see all head nods. Thank you all very much. OK, so we are going to pause for just a second. This is the end of the District 3 forum, and we will move into the District 4 forum in just a few minutes. Thank, thank you all you. very much. Great job. Great job, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Stone. you, everyone. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, guys. Have a good thank one. Thank you all. Enjoy. So good evening, everybody. Thank you. If you are um, returning from District 3, we're moving into District 4. If you are just joining us now, we are doing the District 4 Candidates uh, Forum. And my name again is Gabriel Turan. I'm from the uh, Inner Neighborhood Council Organization. And I will be moderating this evening for running the time and moving us along. And we have uh, three community volunteers who are going to be fielding the questions for us. I'll introduce them in a second. But first, I want to introduce our candidates. We have uh, Mr. Brian McDonald, Mr. Jack Villa, Ms. Lucy Cartagena, and Mr. Efrain Jimenez II. Hello. Hello. And uh, is Mr. Medina here? Saul Medina? I saw him earlier, but I don't see him now. Okay, I'm hoping that he will join us in just a second. And I do see a um, message from Mr. Jimenez that his video won't start. That's perfectly fine. We heard you on your mic. So uh, as long as we can hear you, I think we're okay. Uh, All right. So, okay. So the way that we're going to run things this evening is that we are going to um, 
be going through these questions and uh, we have two minutes at the beginning for opening statement, two minutes at the end for closing statements and questions and answers in between. Each response from each candidate will have one and a half minutes for response. And we have a lot of candidates here for this race. And so we're going to have a really tight schedule and um, I will be going right into it. So first, let's start with our opening statements. And we're going to start with um, in alphabetical order. And uh, so we're going to start with Miss Lucy Cartagena. And you will have two minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. I mean, good evening. Can you guys hear me good? OK. Yeah. Hi, I, my name is Lucy Cartagena and I am the most viable candidate as I am boots on the ground and I have and will continue to work my community for my community. I'm a long time 30 plus year resident and I raised my children here as a past PTA president for Channel Islands High School. I know the importance of school and community and I know that I have also been previous um, campaigns worked on different candidates and different officials here. And I've also served as the vice chair of our homeless commission for the city of Oxnard. I know the needs and, la and the lacks of what our city needs. I am here to serve and bring transparency and demand accountability of our extremely high paid city staff that do not live here. I am a founder of Families First, a nonprofit organization that offers parenting and co-parenting classes and I offer um, workshops on credit report, repair, time management, and various others as long as, and we also bring in leadership speakers. We believe that parents is a child first teacher and equip our parents with the tools needed to implement the link between home, school, and community. My goal is to unite communities and collectively change the landscape of our city through civic stewardship, civic engagement, and servitude. We can implement the ripple. 30 seconds. Make a difference citywide. I urge you to vote for me in the coming week as everyone gets a mail in ballot and free postage. Vote early and vote Lucy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, we are going alphabetically to start with. And the next will be Mr. Efrain Jimenez. You have two minutes. Okay. Oh, before you continue, Mr. Jimenez, excuse me for that. I ask all candidates and our panelists, please mute yourself when you are not speaking so we don't have interruptions for our um, person who is speaking. Okay, Mr. Jimenez, go ahead. Hello, my name is Efren Jimenez II. I was born in Oxnard, California. I'm 31 years old. So um, I was born at the, at the old St. John's, so I'm about that old. And, um, you know, some people try to put me in the 80s kids section, but, you know, I was in 90s kids more than anything else. But uh, when I was a kid, you know, I wanted to be a cop. Um, my dad was a drug addict and he sold my Nintendo when I was a kid, you know? So, um, yeah, I know what a lot of people deal with around here as far as um, dealing with family members who are down and out, people who don't quite have answers for things that they have questions for. And um, throughout most of my life, people have told me not to toot my horn, but that they told me that I was pretty smart. And, um, People have always told me I'd be a pretty good lawyer because I like to argue. And uh, I never really wanted to do that. I wanted to be a teacher um, because a lot of my classmates were not that great. Most of them in high school couldn't identify an adverb. And so a lot of those things stuck with me. And as I've gotten older, um, I started studying um, political science. I have my, I got my first associate this last year um, in the, during, this, during, the, during the fall or the spring semester. I got an associate in uh, paralegal studies, and I'm currently working on my political science transfer associate's degree to transfer to CSU. And as I've gained more traction in my career, people have asked me more and more questions. People who just don't know the seconds. answers. Most people actually in my district don't even know who our councilman is. Um, a lot of them are Spanish speakers. Um, it's not uncommon considering there's 75% Hispanics approximately in Oxnard. And I think that those people need answers. So uh, I'm here to be an avatar for the people. I'm here to be a voice of the unheard. And I will do so with every ounce of wit and wisdom I possess. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. We now move on to Mr. Brian McDonald. Mr. McDonald, you have two minutes. Thank you, sir. Um, my mic is working correctly. I've got two different buttons here. 
Yes, we hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Brian McDonald. I've been a resident of Oxford since uh, it's been a few years. I spent 30 years with the Oxford Police Department, retired about 13 or 14 years ago, and then ran for office because I wanted to do more to serve my community. And I'm finishing up my third term now, and there's still a few projects I would like to see finished up around this community. One of those efforts is, is the Halico Waste Site down in the south end of town. I know that's not in my district anymore, but it's something I've been working on for about 12 years now. And we've made a lot of progress with EPA. We're now dealing with the Department of Toxic Substances. And I think we have a clear path on how to make that a more user-friendly, a more usable site, restore a lot of the natural wetlands and so on and so forth. In terms of why I decided to run one more time is I think we're on the verge of getting back to the greatness we were. And there's been a lot of comments about our finances and the city financial system has been weak for quite some time. And we're in the process of, of upgrading it, fixing it and making it more transparent. And recently there've been messages going back and forth about hidden salaries, why Oxnard doesn't report. And I've mentioned to several people that the current salary structure is on our website. We're 30 seconds out there on the website that you can access. So I think we're heading the right direction. I think we have a long way to go. Um, and I'd like to be part of that process for the next four years. So thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this. And I look forward to answering uh, the questions. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a candidate, Mr. Saul Medina, and I see he has joined us. Um, is your uh, microphone work, Mr. Medina? Yes, it's okay, on. Okay, perfect. You have two minutes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Saul Medina. I'm a resident of Oxnard for over 40 years. Uh, I was not born in Oxnard, but I was raised in Oxnard. Went to Rose Avenue School, Fremont Junior High, Rio Mesa High School, Oxnard, California. Trans, uh, uh, Auctioner College, then went to UCSB, got my bachelor's and my master's in social work at San Jose State. Once receiving my uh, master's, I came back to my community to be a social worker, a clinical social worker, and work with people with mental health issues. Um, during that time, I became involved in my neighborhood at that time, which was Rose Park, and being able to get uh, signs to be able to clean the streets. That was one of the things that I appreciate the neighborhood councils for doing. Uh, I was able to become active and it grown from there. Um, I ran from office before and uh, in 2004, uh, I, was the, I was appointed to a planning commission and I served in 2013. In those eight years, we were able to build some phenomenal buildings, such as the Press Career Apartments, which is currently in the 4th District, also the collections, and also was able to do the Sakialka uh, Farms, which uh, the master plan, which I participated not only in the 2020 plan, but also in the 2030 plan. 30 my, seconds. My commitment is to bring Oxnard back to proper planning, remove the weeds, fix the streets, and remove big trucks from Rose Avenue during peak times of six in the morning and nine in the morning, and also from three o'clock in the afternoon to six in the afternoon during traffic. Um, we can do that. And we need uh, better planning to reroute some of the truck routes and also to improve your, traffic your congestion. Time has expired, Thank sir. you. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to uh, the candidate, Mr. Jack Villa. Mr. Villa, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you, Gabe. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I hear you. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jack Villa. Uh, I was born and raised in Oxnard. Uh, my family's been here since 1916. Uh, I'm retired from the U.S. Postal Service for 34 years. Uh, I've had 43 years of voluntary service since I was 20 years old, and I've never stopped. Whether it was youth, the schools, the neighborhoods, the arts, the workplace, I volunteered and served the public. 30 years of working with youth in, in sports, 
PTA. Uh, I was the Postal Services uh, Workers Union president. I was a, also a state postal uh, workers on the e-board and represented the tri-counties. I served on the Ventura County Grand Jury. I've been on several committees, city committees and county committees. Uh, and I am the chair to the Hobson Park East Neighborhood Council. And I am currently the chair to the Inner Neighborhood Council organization. And my, my three important items that I will be focusing on is public safety. 30 seconds. With more youth investment and fiscal responsibility by transparency and leadership with a greater engagement from council with the neighborhood councils. I look forward to representing District 3, where our District 4, where I was born and raised near Durley Park. I went to Haydock Junior High, Driffle School, and that was the area where I grew up. And, and your time has expired, Mr. Villa. District 4. Thank you. Thank you very much. For our first question, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Alex Ray Rivera, and we will um, start with the same order, and then we will be cycling through so that hopefully everybody gets a chance to go first and a chance to go last. So we'll start with Ms. Cartagena, followed by Mr. Jimenez, then Mr. McDonald, Mr. Medina, and Mr. Villa. The same order we just did. Let's start. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Oh, Alex, you are on mute. My apologies on that. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, this question is for you, Lucy. Uh, what is your number one priority for District 4 and how do you plan to accomplish it? Homelessness. As the past vice chair of the Homeless Commission, I seen what our city didn't allow us to do. I was one of the ones that feared having them open up that navigation center. And I have seen what we lacked. We, I was the one that helped do the five-year plan that the city is now trying to implement. It lacks a lot of, there's too many gaps. We need to change our ADUs. We need to change our ordinances. We need micro housing. We need tent city. We need vacant property tax. We need a lot more. And those are things that can be done that do not cost the city additional money. One of my biggest things on the five-year plan that I kept asking the city and I still fight for it, is that we have a permanent grant writer. So we can find those monies out there that belong to us for homeless issues that other cities get to use. Our money right now funnels through the continuum of care. That's a big Tura County organization that takes our city of Oxnard money, money right now. So they take the product seconds. and they distribute it. I would like our money back because our city only has one place for a one-stop program and other cities have nine. So that's my number one priority. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, uh, what is your number one priority for District 4 and how do you plan to accomplish it? You're, you're on mute, just like I was. I apologize. There you go. Uh, I was so energetic too. Um, when I, okay, so when I walked around doing my nominations, I actually went to people I didn't know entirely. I didn't get a, I only got like four of them from people that actually knew who I was. And I did that so I could get a better feel of what these people, what people wanted, what people were, were missing out on. And a lot of them told me, you know, their problems. Like I passed by one house where a gentleman told me that three people in his house were out of work because of the coronavirus. And these are concerns that they have because they have concerns when it comes to things like like measure E for one thing, you know, it's a big deal for them. They wonder how much they're gonna have to pay extra, how much they're gonna be putting out. And although most people, you know, to, these, to most people it's not a big deal, you know, to pay a couple, a little bit extra tax, you know, to a lot of people who especially are out of work. And um, my district is especially famous for having a heavy population of people who- um, 30 seconds. Who cannot vote, let's just say. And, um, it's important for me to reach out to as many of those people as I can and be a voice for them because I am able to, I'm able to extrapolate what people say and to reverberate it in a way that is, that is meaningful and tangible. And I think that I can do that if I 
am elected. I think I would have a much better platform in order to reach more people and to gather more of what they need for them. Thank you. Councilman McDonald, what's your number one priority for District 4 and how do you plan to accomplish it? Well, and this is probably going to be citywide, but we really need to get back on our financial feed. We have taken a beating with this pandemic. People are out of work. They can't afford to, to do the things they normally would. Our business community is suffering. Our parks are suffering. We have a homeless population that needs assistance. And being homeless is more than just being without somewhere to live. A lot of the folks in that camp or in that um, community have other issues that they need help with, be it drug addiction, alcohol addiction, psychological services, what have you. So I, I've always been vocal about we need more than just a shelter to have people sleep somewhere at night. We need programs to help them deal with what ails them or what their issues are to get them back right on their feet and moving in the right direction. I think we've been short selling that for a long, long time. We've just been warehousing people. I think that's been ineffective. We really need to concentrate on our 30 business seconds. because without a strong, vibrant downtown business community, we're going to suffer. And we need to bring in things that will attract people to Oxnard that no one else in this community has or in the county has so that Oxnard is the place to go. We need to market ourselves and move forward in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Medina, what's your top priority for District 4 and how will you accomplish it? Well, I have two. Um, the first one is to make sure that Measure O money is being used in the 4th District, especially for the streets and alleys. Um, I've looked at the Measure O funding and it was $8 million for a fire station, another $12 million for public parks in, in Oxnard College Park, However, only $1.2 million for streets. That's why the initiatives that Aaron Starr has brought up have gone traction because the measure O was for a balance of public parks, public safety, and yes, our streets. And that's one of my priorities is to be able to redistribute that money where it belongs. And the streets are uh, in need of repair and also the alley. Number two, we should not overlook the fact that Oxnard, especially 93030 zip code, is number, is number one in the county in COVID with over 5,000 um, people that's tested positive. We need to do a better job. Yes, we're moving towards reopening, but we definitely need to do better jobs because there's a lot of businesses who are suffering and a lot of essential workers. I'm, a, I'm an essential healthcare worker and I have to be careful where I go and so I don't test positive and I don't get my clinic um, infected as well. So we need to do a better and job your, your in doing that. Your time has expired, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Uh, Mr. Jack Villa, will you please share with us your top priorities for District 4 and how you plan to accomplish it? Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, my top uh, priority would be the financial situation for the city. Uh, right now, Measure E is up to the voters. Uh, it'll increase the taxes by one and a half uh, uh, cents. And I am against Measure E as it is written. The tax money is no question, no doubt in my mind that we need the revenue. But the way it was posted with no end date and no specifics of how that money spent um, is troubling to me. I would not ask the residents for a one and a half cents for those families that are struggling, struggling to the point where they have to decide, do I spend $25 on gas or do I spend $25 on that deductible to go see the doctor? And usually the poor will, 30 will seconds. use that $25 to put in gas. And so I would be, a, if it does pass, I would be a proponent of watching, uh, having a committee, oversight committee, and uh, making sure that that money is spent to, uh, to the will of the people. That's all I have. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question will be from Ms. Diana Vilsi. And uh, the order this time, Mr. Jimenez will go first, followed by Mr. McDonald, 
followed by Mr. Medina, followed by Mr. Villa, and Ms. Cartagena will go last for this question. And uh, just make sure you go off mute, Ms. Felsey. I'm not, I'm not remembering that tonight. <laughs> what are your ideas to reinvigorate economic development in District 4, especially in downtown? Mr. Jimenez. Well, in downtown, that's kind of, I'm sorry? Oh, in downtown, um, I know that there's a lot of things going on with uh, the planning and development groups. Um, I know that a lot of people have, I mean, I know like for instance, um, this one gentleman, Mr. Aurelio, he um, spoke about development in downtown and about how that kind of stuff would work. And I've watched a few videos that uh, Roy Prince has put on his own websites and um, they're pretty good. I mean, I understand like the need to advance, to expand in downtown and to have more, I guess, um, to have utilities and everything more in a, in a more confined, a more contained area that people can, you know, be more efficiently used. It can be more efficiently usable there. But um, a lot of the, the, the lot of stuff I think is more of like saviors. And I wonder what happens with South Oxnard because there is a heavy like homeless population there. For instance, I work at the, um, I work by Superior Grocers and I know for a fact that there are many homeless people out in that parking lot because I've had to call the police on them several 30 times. seconds. Um, and so for the city to have gone about trying to put in a Zocalo there, that would have cost, you know, whatever. And, you know, it, it would have just been a meeting place for the homeless to hang out there and bug regular, regular folks. And so the way I see it is Saviors has to be developed because it's usable, because it's it's perfect. It's fine. It's good property, good land and everything. But um, yeah, we just need somebody to do, figure it out, to figure out how, how to do it and not go about it shystily. Okay, thank you. Mr. McDonald, what, what, what are your ideas to reinvigorate economic development in District 4, especially in downtown? Well, we need to have an environment that people want to come and build in and work in and live in. And there are a lot of issues, a lot of reasons why some people are uncomfortable downtown right now. For a while, we had a very big problem with people in Plaza Park that were just loitering, hanging around. The businesses locally were complaining about them walking in, using their bathrooms, making a mess out of things, um, and so on and so forth. And I don't have any problems with, with someone that, you know, is down on their luck that needs a hand up, but they need to be part of the solution. And so I think we need programs to address that, to get them back into the circle of working within the community. We need to, to bring businesses downtown that no other community has around us. That's how you drop people back into your community. You bring in unique individualized businesses that you can't get in Ventura or Santa Paula or- 30 Cameron. seconds. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity for looking at, at mixed use development downtown. Um, we just need to do the right choice the first time and not have to come back and fix it many times, which has unfortunately been our past. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Medina, what are your ideas to reinvigorate economic development in District 4, especially in downtown? Uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, since I've been on the Planning Commission from 2004 to 2013, I had pushed for mixed use in downtown, which a mixed use is having a business on the bottom and livable places on the top. If you look at um, the building right across uh, from uh, uh, a billiard place on A Street and uh, 7th Street, that is actually a mixed use. In the front, you have businesses, and on the top, you have a livable place. Uh, that was one of the area. That was one of the developments that I was very proud to uh, support in bringing that. The other one was the drive-in. The drive-in was uh, nothing but uh, asphalt. And now, if you go to the drive-in, which is actually on Five Point, it's livable places. So that was one of the things that came up before the planning commission. And if you look at it, that's what needs to be done. Currently in downtown, 30 Oxnard, seconds. they're going to do that billboard apartment, which is over, also over there by 7th Street and also by the Press Career, something that I'm very proud to have supported uh, in downtown. So we have to have businesses and you have to have people that are living there in order to 
to replenish and, and buy and see those businesses, such as a coffee, whether it's a restaurant or whether it's a business uh, um, livable workspace, which currently we're all doing now with Zoom. Thank you, uh, Jack Villa. Uh, same question. What are you? What are your ideas to reinvigorate the economic development in District Four, especially in downtown? Yes, thank you, um, Diana. Uh, my, I would be in favor of, of mixed use uh, um, development, and also the the city has five to six million dollars that they can use on downtown. Uh, they have not used it. It's been in the city for several years now. Uh, that money should be used uh, for the improvement of downtown and getting with the, the stakeholders, the businesses downtown, and how to use that, uh, whether it's improving the frontage or more parking, uh, better streets, better alleys. But I believe that they have five and, uh, to six million dollars that can be spent on downtown. And with the combination of mixed use uh, development, uh, I believe downtown can be a, a thriving uh, a business area just like it was years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Cartagena, same question to you. What are your ideas to reinvigorate economic development in District 4, especially in downtown? Well, I think what everybody forgot to say, which is really sad because we have an incumbent there for 12 years, why they didn't bring up the charade that the downtown has been working on. I mean, that's not unknown. Why is the charade not part of it? Why haven't they changed anything in the whole time? There's monies that were put there just for the revitalization that the city took for general fund. So why isn't that being talked about? The downtown can be do good. And like Saul said, maybe mixed use is good. They're working on that. But that's not going to fix the downtown problem. The downtown needs real solutions and it needs a whole community solution based asset. So you have to work on the abandoned buildings. Why are they still abandoned? Why are they kept in, in very distressed forms? We have to work on code regulations. That's a whole other thing. Saul, as being on planning commission, should know that our planning commission, um, just to get your code up and done, is a, is a mission. It takes 30 seconds. years to even get a permit. So I think we need to work on green spaces, put our money back where it goes. There's millions of dollars waiting there. So the solutions are for those already sitting on council and those that are yet to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gabe? Thank you, Diana. Our next question will be taken by Mr. Manuel Herrera, and the order will be Mr. McDonald, followed by Mr. Medina, followed by Mr. Villa, followed by Ms. Cartagena, followed by Mr. Jimenez. Good evening to all of you. Uh, my question, so first is uh, to Mr. McDonald. Of the five local ballot measures, which do you support and which do you oppose? And I presume you're talking about measure E plus the, the measures by Mr. Stark, correct? Correct. I am, I'll start out by saying that I am not a fan of, of raising taxes, but it gets to a point where you have to look at what you're able to do or not able to do and decide how do you fix that. And I've looked at Measure E. Um, the one thing about Measure E is it doesn't affect grocery sales. It doesn't affect pharmaceuticals. It doesn't affect trade services. Um, so there will still be an opportunity for people to, to get things they need without necessarily having to pay the increased tax. Uh, it's never pleasant to raise taxes, but we have been so hammered by this pandemic that even if things were to go back to normal tomorrow, it's gonna to take us at least a year, if not longer, to recover the revenue that we've lost because of the pandemic. Uh, it takes a long time to recover. 30 seconds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna support Measure E. Um, I've looked at Mr. Starr's uh, suggestions. Unfortunately, I just can't agree with any of them. I don't think any of them would be good for our community. 
I think many of them would be detrimental to our community, so I'm not in favor of any of the other initiatives. Okay, thank you. Mr. Medina, uh, again, of all the local ballot measures, which do you support and which do you oppose? Thank you, Manuel, for asking that question. This will be easy. None of them. From E all the way down. The reason is because only me and Brian McDonald were in support of Measure O. Measure E affects Measure O by giving it a sunset. And I think that is counterproductive to being able to uh, have a double tax for a certain amount of time where people are going to be forced in, in order to be double taxed almost like 10%. That's not what Measure O was, was, was intended to, to be doubled up. Measure E is, wants to do that in order to eliminate Measure O later on. And that's what I oppose uh, Measure E. At first, it was a good idea. But however, we cannot continue to ask the taxpayer to fund poor management. We need to do a better job with our seconds. resources. And I am a supporter of Measure O but I am not a, a supporter of any of those measures. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Villa, same question. Yes, I think I already talked a little bit about Measure E. I am yeah. uh, against Measure E and yes on the others. Uh, measure E is probably the most important. I, I realize that we need the revenue and to get back to the normal and get all the services that Oxnard deserves. But I believe it should be an end date so that the voters and the taxpayers have some type of control. Uh, if they put a 10 year or five year, whatever uh, end date, the voters can come back or the city can come back and reevaluate our finances to ask the city, uh, the residents for more or less or whatever, but the voters will ha not have any control after it's, it's passed and it will be forever. Right now we have several people, uh, uh, residents that don't even know whether they're gonna get their job back during this COVID 30 crisis. 30 seconds. Uh, we have four people, like I said, that are struggling people that are deciding between gas yeah. in the car or going to see their doctor. And that's a predicament that several families have. Plus, moving uh, two, three families in a home. Uh, I'm here to represent the, the, the people. And I, I see it going from neighborhoods to neighborhoods. They are not happy with the situation in which Oxnard. Your time has expired. And they're, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Cartagena? Mr. Herr, can you repeat that question? I got lost over there. Sure, absolutely. Uh, of all the local ballots, which do you support and which do you oppose? Okay, so that's E to all of them. Um, I, I, I leave that up to the, the taxpayers and the voters because I wasn't privy to sitting on that information as the city manager is talking about. Um, I don't really totally understand Measure E. It's extremely vague, it's ambiguous, it's vast. So to every little thing it says it can do is a whole paragraph in itself. And how is it supposed to do that? So that's something I really, really need the um, voters and everybody to really look at and see. Do you wanna go ahead and repeat another measure? Oh, because even that was written at one time where it was supposed to help our youth. And it never did that but take care of the general fund. So that's something we really have to think. Are we still gonna keep doing measures after measure after measure to keep um, putting a Band-Aid on the bleeding cow? That's Oxnard. And the other measures out there, again, the voters need to really, really, really look at and understand if that's something we really wanna do and be smart about our voting process. You're asking me a personal question? Ask me, but I really take it back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Okay, well, most of you who know who I am know that I am against Measure E. And it's not because I don't want to pay taxes or anything or I don't think it's necessary. I actually do think it's necessary. I just think that 
Um, their main, the two things I want to quote that kind of like give my idea of it. One thing was something that Alex Nguyen said actually when he was talking about um, the DA aud audit. He said that those that that those done a few years ago. He said that they had concluded that there were de there was a pattern of decades of mismanagement, and a what do you say a pattern of of corruption basically. And so that compared with a few of the other findings that we found about where revenue has been going, particularly police pensions and um, government administrative pensions and benefits. Um, I'm against measure E. I believe that there should be a shorter tack, maybe two to four. I've said this several times all over Mr. Herrera's um, forum. And um, the other star ballots, the only one I have doubts on is N, actually. And that's because of the importance of measure O. But um, real quick, measure 30 seconds. F, it's good for, um, for bringing in business, just like Mr. Starr has mentioned in his measure proposal thingies. Um, it's, uh, it and it does bypass the city, which we, as, as we all know, is very slow at pulling off those kind of at pulling off certifications. Measure L would... Um, would make the chief financial officer the what's it called the um the treasurer i think that's fine too i think separation of powers is great it's one of the things that this country is based on and i love the federalist papers and secondly m i think m is definitely necessary meetings need to be shorter i mean it needs to be more concise your time has expired thank you okay thank you all Thank you very much. Our next question will be taken by Alex Ray Rivera, and the order will be Mr. Medina, followed by Mr. Villa, Ms. Cartagena, Mr. Jimenez, and Mr. McDonald. Thanks again, Gabe. Uh, we're gonna start with you, Saul. We've had a discussion a little bit about the homeless um, issues in Oxnard. Are you aware of the city's uh, current plans uh, for homeless solutions? What are your thoughts on them? And uh, what would you do differently if you, if you could improve? Thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, the city of Oxnard missed the, the home key uh, funding that recently was awarded. Oxnard wasn't one of them, unfortunately. What, one of the things, uh, homelessness is such a complex issue. Um, I am a clinical social worker, so I'm a, I'm a therapist by trade. And one of my specialties is dual diagnosis with mental health, and substance abuse. Part of the issue is increasing the, the sober living homes in Oxnard, which if the cannabis uh, industry would come in and they would want to fund uh, sober livings for alcohol, drug use, and that half, if that, that was one of the ways to uh, accomplish that, I would be for that. But the part of the issue is, is collaborating with Human Services Agency, Ventura County, in order to be able to work and placing and uh, in a sober living, not just putting them in a, in a 30 hotel, seconds, but it's a more complex issue, job placement, health care, uh, those sorts of things. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that we need to work collaboratively with the agencies that are already there. And I will be able to do that and help with that process because that's what I do for a living. That's my profession. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Villa, um, same question. Uh, can you give us your opinion or your feedback on the current homeless solutions proposed by the city? And um, also, as you know, there was a lot of them at the Plaza Park, Lions Park, and all the way down to Halico. Yes, thank you, Alex, for the question. Uh, homelessness is, is, is a big problem. It's like an octopus, it has several arms. housing, uh, mental health, uh, drug abuse, and so on. And uh, cities are having the burden of uh, the city of residents. I have a heart for, for homelessness, but lately uh, I've seen that vagrancy is where the home, the residents are having frustration uh, with vagrancy and people urinating in the park, uh, petty crime, and so on. 30 seconds. Uh, some of those services for mental health and, and, uh, and health and, and drug abuse. And I believe the city should work closer with the county uh, in uh, either 
a joint effort or putting more money into these programs. Uh, we need more housing, of course, uh, and uh, some of the plans uh, that uh, that the uh, city is going through. Mr. With, Villa, um, your time has the expired. Vagabond. Uh, okay. Can you, can you hear me, Jack? Thank Sorry, you. we had a little we had a little technical yes. difficulty there, but thank you. Yes, um, I gave you a few more extra seconds, Jack, because you were pausing. So just be mindful of your oh, okay. internet connection. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Lucy, can you give us your opinion on that uh, proposed downtown homeless shelter in, in, in uh, right there at the corner of Second and B? Can you give us your thoughts on that or any any uh, opinions on what you could do better to improve the homeless situation in Oxnard? Well, I would never approve a $37 million building that will only house 200 people. That's my first thought. It, it is not going to do nothing but a drop in the dime for our homeless issues. At our last um, count point in time count, we counted over 600 plus homeless individuals. And that's only what we see on the surface. Homeless people hide. We don't see the service resistant. We don't see everything else. I know one of the other um, persons mentioned putting into sober living. Sober living is unregulated. It takes general relief from the homeless and it takes their food stamps. So unless you can regulate and really think of how you're gonna do sober living, that is not an option. That does not take care of all the solutions. There are other solutions, there's vast solutions and there are solutions that don't even cost money. I think the city needs to really invest in the people. I've asked for prevention and education when I was a homeless commissioner. The number one thing we need to do is prevent homeless. That would probably be like the number one solution. The second solution is to educate people on homeless and homeless issues. So when we seconds. talk about homelessness, if you've already been sitting there as a, as a council member and you did nothing in this whole time, don't come up to the plate now and start playing house. So homelessness is a real solution, is a real issue, and there are real solutions. And it takes a village to take care of that. I urge you again to vote Lucy and help me help the homeless solutions with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, um, are you aware of the, uh, what the city is doing to improve uh, the situation with the homelessness? Can you give us your, uh, your opinion on it? Um, that's the homeless complex building that's been, uh, that Mr. Herrera's forum has been talking about pretty recently, right? That they're yeah, gonna hold a meeting on? Yeah. That, well, the city, um, yeah, the city has proposed some improvements um, to address okay. this issue. I think that the homelessness is a big issue considering I've dealt with them so much. I used to work on the Avenue in Ventura for five years. Um, you know, I've seen every every different facet of it. You've seen the the ones, the, the drug addicts. We've seen the, just the ones down on their luck. I've seen, you know, seen it all. And each of them need help in some way, more help than we can give them face to face. That's one of the biggest problems um, uh, that I have is that some of them just don't have the will to change and some of them don't have the will to do anything about their situation and don't have enough for people to be to, and then I have enough people tell like spending the time to go out there and try to do that. I believe that if any of us were to sit down with a homeless, a homeless for a day, maybe even a week and I just stay there and figure out his life, I'm sure we could figure out what it was that caused him to get there. But most of us don't have that time. We just don't have the, the, we don't have that time to go out there and go find out what's wrong with them and help them out. And, um, I think that it is a city thing. I think that everybody that that is in this city that is homeless is part of the overall encompassing, you know, responsibility of the city. But it's not for us to go out and do each individual thing. I think the complex might have been a good idea. It was a little expensive. Um, and I think that other at routes can be found if we put our heads together. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilman McDonald, can you uh, can you tell me, does the city still have a homeless coordinator? And can you tell us the position that you took on that downtown um, uh, homeless center that's being proposed? I don't know if we replaced the homeless coordinator or not. We did have one at one time. He's since left the city, and I don't know if his position has been filled or not. Um, people have to remember that we're under the gun from the county of Ventura because we're using the armory as a housing facility for homeless people right now, and it's year-round. And it's in the flight path. We technically cannot have a residential facility in the flight path, the approach path to the airport. So we're, we're getting pressure from the county to do something. The downtown navigation center, what was brought to us was approval to negotiate with Mercy Housing 
to see whether it would be viable or not. There's been no deal inked to build it at second and B. Uh, and I will be the first one to say, I'm not a fan of putting it at second and B. I think it's too congested area. I think a four story building or a five story building in that area will be uh, probably not the right thing. And I think there are other areas in the city that we might be able to locate it and have them available or other services available to them. 30 you seconds. Know, this is more than just finding some place to live for someone. There are some people that aren't going to want to participate in the program. They're not going to deal with their demons. They don't want to deal with their demons. We have to have other alternatives for them. But for the ones that do want to be part of the solution, we need to have some sort of a navigation center somewhere. I'm just not convinced that downtown is the right place for it, but we've got to start looking somewhere. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We are now going to transition into closing statements and each candidate again will have uh, 30, um, excuse me, two minutes for a closing statement. The order of this will be, uh, we'll be starting with Mr. Villa, followed by Ms. Cartagena, <clears throat> Mr. Jimenez, Mr. McDonald, and Mr. Medina. So uh, Mr. Villa, you have two minutes for closing statement. Uh, thank you, Gabe. Uh, and thank you for the INCO and all the volunteers that put on the, uh, the forum. Um, I know it's, a, it's quite a bit of work, uh, and I know you guys volunteer in doing it, so thank you to all of you. I'm asking the, the, the voters of District 4 to consider me and vote for me on November 4th. If you look at my resume, you'll see that I have 43 years of voluntary service, whether it was schools, the neighborhoods, the arts, the, uh, <clears throat> the workplace, the youth, there's no place, there's no, uh, there's no uh, area that I haven't volunteered in. Uh, and I believe I am the best person for District 4. I was born and raised there. I can probably name all the streets because I worked for the Postal Service uh, uh, and sorted mail for District 4 as well. And I really want you to look at the resume for all the, the candidates. They're very good candidates, but I believe if you look at mine, mine's is, mine is more adapted or uh, mine is more uh, geared for district four. 30 seconds. And I just hope uh, everyone votes and, uh, and take your time to uh, look at the ballot and look at the candidates and uh, also issue uh, initiative E. Uh, my recommendation is no. Let's put it up with an end date and specifics on how it's spent. And that's, that's it. So thank you, Gabe. Thank you very much. Ms. Cartagena, you have two minutes. Everybody, again, I urge you to vote for me, Mr. Cartagena. Um, I want you guys to remember that we have to ask ourselves when we vote for a council member, what have they done so far? What have they done in the community as boots on the ground? What are they doing? Do they just come every November to run and then disappear? What have they done? I have 100% endorsed by Planned Parenthood because I work LGBTQ issues. I was one of the ones that helped bring in the pride at Oxnard ever. I am also one of the ones that brought in the reading in the parks so that we implement free libraries. I do the Halloween event in downtown Oxnard every year free of charge. I do a make a difference day for the city of Oxnard. I really work the homeless community too, which is our number one priority as a homeless commission pass to make sure that we take care of our issues. So we can all say what we would like to do and our pipe dreams, or we can say that we, what we worked on, but didn't implement in the whole time. So it's time for change and it's time to get uncomfortable and it's time for us to make that change together because I do believe in working collaboratively to change the dynamic and the landscape of our community. And I urge you to 30 vote. seconds. Pronouns she and her, 
to be that council member to help implement what we need to do in Oxnard together. Juntos, vinculo, gente con la gente. Thank you very much. Again, vote Lucy, District 4, vote Lucy, Cartagena.com. And please reach out to me if you have any more questions. I'm here on Facebook, Instagram, and I'm all over the community. And thank you very much. And I appreciate everything you guys did. And thank you for having this game. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Cartagena. Mr. Jimenez, you have two minutes. Thank you. I know that many of you probably didn't know who I was before this. And I know that many of you probably find me abrasive and a little bit of a loud mouth. But um, thank you. But um, I just want you to know that I'm here for you guys. And um, I have nothing going for me. I'm not involved. You know, I'm not receiving any pensions from anything. Um, you know, I can actually, you know, with my, I, I've been doing propositions for people. I've been like reading them, trying to figure out where, where, like where money goes, you know, who's getting administrative funds from all the California props and things like that. Every year I do it. And, you know, I'm a paralegal studies. And like I said, I got, I have an associate in that. I have a certificate in that. I, I, I like to read law. I like to read literature. And I think that you guys need somebody who will dive in and do that and find out and give it to people, report it to people. And maybe it's just how I am, but, but I think I'm the right person for that. I think that I have the tenacity and the lack of conflict of interest to effectively pull off what I'm trying to do. And that's to help everybody that lives in my district and by effect, help other people that don't live in my district, but live in my city. When I was young, I mean, you know, I've always wanted to, I thought, I mean, there's so many things out there that I saw when I was a kid that I was growing up, you know, people getting robbed and stuff. And my, I mean, you know, people, have slept, I mean, homeless people have slept on the side of my house before. And I, I get it. And I've thought about moving before because people have, you know, not liked the way I talk. Sometimes they think I'm a little, you know, a little abrasive, like I said, and that I don't know 30 what I'm seconds. talking about. But um, I just, I am, and I am very competent. And I think if you ask anybody who knows me, they'll tell you that I'm way too smart for my own good. And um, I'm only 31. So, I mean, if when I, if you get, if I get your vote, you know, I'm going to do my best to get to where Mr. V has been, you know, to do as much, have as much experience as him under my belt by his age. And um, yeah, so that's it. That's, I'm F. And if you have any more questions, hit me up. I'm on Facebook and Instagram also, so. Thank you very much. Mr. McDonald, you have two minutes for your closing statement. Thank you. Thank you to the IMCO for sponsoring this forum and allowing us all to come out and participate. And, and I have to tip my hat to my peers that are are involved in this effort as, as well as I am. I think that's a testament to the community that you have people that are so interested in the betterment of the community that they take time out of their lives to come forward and do what they can to try and be part of the solution. I, I'm proud of, of all of them. I appreciate all of them. I, um, I come from public safety roots, a public safety background, and I won't deny that. And I believe very strongly that we need a very strong, robust public safety uh, program in this community. The police department in the last two years has lost 18 uh, sworn positions. The fire department has not grown the staff that they need to do. They've delayed a fire training academy. These are our first responders. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do on that front to get our police department uh, more back in touch with our community. Right now, they're so understaffed. They run from call to call to call. They have no time to engage in what we call community-oriented policing. And they I think Sir Robert Peel said, the police are part of the community and the community are part of the police. And we, we don't have that right now. We need to be better connected. Same thing with the fire safety folks. I believe in strong, robust public safety for the betterment of the community. Not to take over the city, not to take all the money, but to make sure that this community is safe. Um, and I won't stand down from that approach. 30 seconds. Thank you. I think there's a lot that we can do uh, in the future uh, I am really looking forward to having a solution for Halico uh, within this next term uh, because there's a lot of the work that's gone on, a lot that can benefit our community overall, and I look forward to being a part of that process. I would be honored with your vote for another term. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Medina, you will be our uh, final candidate. Two more minutes, please. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you for having this forum. I just want to uh, say um, my journey has, has been to make amends, you know, and uh, this is our last round in 2008. Uh, it didn't go so well. 
Um, but currently, I am looking forward to the challenge to uh, make sure Oxnard gets to where it needs to be at. And part of that is with the Measure O Fund, not only for the streets, uh, not only for the COVID, but also for the Performing Arts Center. Unfortunately, it wasn't one of the topics, but it's one of the topics that's clear and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I want to improve that for the public arts in the city of Oxnard. That's why uh, Javier Gomez, Mr. G, has endorsed me for District 4. So it's very important that we work and make sure that the arts is part of our culture of Oxnard, however blended it is. Uh, you know, as a therapist, I was one of the few therapists that actually ran a group for a pride group as considered as an ally. And when I did it, I did it because there was a need. I am, I, I put my money where my mouth is. That's why I opened my business in downtown Oxnard in San Jose's office called Gold Coast Therapist because I believe in the downtown. I am just don't talk about it. I do it with my actions. And that's the kind of a planning commissioner I was. And that's how I will be if I'm like, uh, able to get your votes to be on the city council to represent the district four. So please vote for me, Saul Medina, former planning commissioner, and hopefully your future council member. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank all of our candidates who came out tonight and uh, I think we lost our moderator. I made time to speak to the public. Thank you all. I'd ask the audience to applaud for all of you. So thank I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I, I guess I need a break. Um, anyways, so thank you all very much. Round of applause for all of you for coming out. Uh, one last thing, I will say District 4, uh, we had a pre-submittal process for questions for every, um, every el election forum that we've done. And District 4 by far received the most questions. And so, um, and you have the most candidates, which is great, but we had limited time to get to all of them. Would you all be willing for us to send these questions to you that we didn't get to tonight, including sure. those that were asked tonight? and you will respond to us okay. and we'll post those for the public review. Certainly. Yes, of course. Great, thank you all very much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and close the District 4 forum and we are gonna transition into District 6. We'll take just a minute break and then we will get started at 7.30. Thank you all very much, District 4 folks, and we have our District 6 folks cycling in. Thank you. Thank you all and have a good evening all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So you know that. I guess I gotta leave. Gracias, Miguel. All right, so our District 6 folks, we'll get started in just a second. If you um, are going to have your cameras on, now is the time to switch those on. All right, and then we have Ale, Yolanda, and Dave who will be doing the questions. There's Ale, there's Dave. Okay, great. Okay, so everybody's here. So we're gonna go ahead and move right into this. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, if you've stayed for the first two or the previous one, we're continuing now with District 6. If you're just now joining us, we are moving into our District 6 forum with our three candidates who are here with us this evening. And first we have Ms. Uh, Vianney Lopez, we have Ms. Carolina Magaña Gallardo and Ms. Carla Alejandra Ramirez, and they're all running for the District 6 Council seat. And our uh, panelists who will be taking the questions this evening for them will be Ms. Alejandra Valencia. We have uh, Ms. Yolanda Solorio and Mr. Dave Ebbett. I am Gabe Turan from the INCO. I'll be helping with the moderation. I'll be doing the timer and moving the evening along. And um, just to have you all understand, we're going to do two minutes of opening statement for each of you. Then we're going to do a Q&A portion where you will have one and a half minutes response for each candidate to each question. Then at the end of the program, we will have two minutes closing statement. Okay. And we are going to start with alphabetical order and then we will move into the Q&A portion where we will cycle you through so everybody gets a chance to go first or go last. 
So we will start with our opening statements. First, uh, we in alphabetical order by last name, we will start with Ms. Fiane Lopez. You have two minutes. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to the INCO for having us today and having this forum. Uh, my name is Vianney Lopez. I am running for re-election to District 6. In the past 10 years, I have dedicated myself to public service through my commitment on the Wainimi Elementary School District Board, where I served from 2012 to 2018, just before I, I was elected to Oxnard City Council. I've also had the opportunity to work with two of our locally elected women, former Congresswoman Lois Capps and currently assembly member Monique Limon, where I have gained the experience and understanding of the needs in our district and our community here in Oxnard. I am looking for reelection to continue serving our residents because I value your input and want to ensure that South Oxnard has a voice and has a big picture of the impacts of everything that goes on in our city and how that relates to South Oxnard. We have had a lot of challenges in the past year and approximately nine months that I have served on the council, but I know that there is more that we can do and what we will, will be able to accomplish in the next four years to ensure that Oxnard has representation and a long-term vision for the benefits of our community and our residents in South Oxford. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go on to Ms. Carolina Magaña Gallardo. You have two minutes. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolina Gallardo Magaña, and I am running for district uh, for City Council District 6. This is my second time running. Um, in 2018, um, we finally got somebody elected to represent South Oxnard residents. And I didn't think I will be running again. Unfortunately, South Oxnard does not have the representation that is needed. And let me tell you a little bit about myself. I came to the States with my empty pockets, full of dreams, yes, full of dreams. And I never thought I would be representing the South Oxnard residents. Um, I am not here to brag about my connections. I am not here to brag who I work for. I am here to brag what I have done, what I have accomplished for South Oxnard residents. And these ones are in two years, in only two years and without being in the council chair. I have been working with the county in the beautification of the Schumas Creek, more known as the J Street Canal. Also, I am the co-creator of a pocket park on Cuesta del Mar, which is going to have programs for the youth, for the kids, for the señoras, for everyone. Also, I still have the food pantry twice a month since 2017. Last year, we had a program where it was called Reading at the Park for the whole month. Also, I helped to save- 30 seconds. 62 for fire station number two. Also, I'm helping to clean Ormond Beach. I participated and I sponsor the third resource fair in South Winds. Also, I have gotten grants from Haas Foundation Public Health for the betterment of South Oxnard residents. And I can, I can I accomplish that and I can accomplish a lot more as your city council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Ramirez, you have two minutes. My name is Cara Alejandra Ramirez. I am 30 years old. I was born in Michoacan, Mexico. I am a 1.5 generation immigrant, which means I migrated here as a child, but ultimately was raised here in the US. I have worked with children for the past years. I am also a full-time student at Oxnard College, double majoring in sociology and anthropology with an emphasis on applied research and a focus on marginalized communities. I have been involved in community oriented organizing for the past decade through various groups, including the Mecha chapter at Oxnard College and the local collective Todo Poder al Pueblo. My focus is collectivism and mutual aid through direct action. The vision I see for Oxnard is a vision of autonomy, of community, led town halls, of dignified housing for all, and of all of those people who have long lived in the shadows to have an opportunity to have their day in the sun. What I lack in years, I make up for in creativity, in the ability to think outside the box many of us have been confined in 
wherein we think that there are no other options to do things beyond the uncreative, unprogressive, and oppressive ways we have been told things must get done. Someone once said that it is foolish to keep doing the same thing over and over again and accept, expect different results. Elected officials in Oxnard have been doing the same thing over and over again and still expect progress. It is time to move away from our proverbial box and start getting seconds. creative. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to move into the questions and answers portion. And again, uh, they will have one minute and 30 seconds for each response and each candidate will be given uh, the same questions or theme of questions. We will start with Ms. Alejandra Valencia who will take our first question and the order is Ms. Lopez, uh, Ms. Gallardo Magaña, and Ms. Ramirez. Good evening everyone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start off um, with question number one. What is your number one priority for District 6 and how do you plan to accomplish it? Thank you. That is a very important question as it relates to the current pandemic and the impact of housing and the housing crisis as it relates to our local community, especially our farm workers. In Oxnard and specifically in South Oxnard, we have 607 families who receive assistance in the form of Section 8 vouchers and uh, uh, under the uh, uh, housing units within the housing authority. We have a lot of work to do to ensure that all our residents have a livable and safe space where they can reside, where their families are growing. We have 168 units throughout uh, South Oxnard that we need to, need to continue improving. I have worked with our staff to submit a grant for federal assistance that would focus on improving the conditions within South Winds, and I will continue to focus on ways to improve the housing conditions of all our residents. Thank you. And Ms. Gallardo Magaña. Ms. Gallardo, you are on mute. I'm sorry. Okay. No worry. <laughs> My priorities for South Oxnard is the infrastructure. Look at our streets, our alleys they are torn down. So we need to look for um, alternatives to look for funds to improve the streets and alleys in South Oxnard. Another one will be a uh, social justice. Um, and I'm sorry, I need to put them. <laughs> uh, we need them um, to make sure nobody enters the Halaco plant because that's a toxic plant, um, a toxic site, I'm sorry. And we also have to work on cleaning Ormond Beach, the lagoon, it's such a beautiful, we have the gem of Oxnard in South Oxnard. So we have to take care of that. Also, I will keep working on finishing the beautification of Shuma Street, better known as J Street Canal. So that will be for social justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallardo. Um, Ms. Ramirez? Well, where can I start? There are a lot of, I think, priorities in South Oxnard. Um, first off, we don't need any more 7-Elevens. We don't need any more gas stations. We need cultural spaces. We need spaces for the people. Uh, we need a homeless shelter, at least more direct resources for the homeless folks down here. Uh, we need to make sure apartment complexes are up to code. A lot of complexes in South Oxnard are in dismal conditions. Uh, we need more resources and help directly in the area for indigenous people, many of them who speak mixed tech languages and they face barriers. Uh, we need some resources, some type of immersion for the kids and maybe the parents here in the South Oxnard um, schools. And how do we get it done? We start asking questions. We start going to whoever we need to go to to start getting this done. We need to start seeing where we can redirect funds from in order to uh, improve this, uh, these, or, or put these programs. Um, 30 seconds. Oh, thank you. In order to get this done, thank you. Thank you all very much. Our next question will be taken by Mr. David Ebbett, and the order will be Ms. Gallardo Magaña, followed by Ms. Ramirez, followed by Ms. Lopez. Good evening, candidates. There is a 
pervasive belief that the city does not invest in South Oxnard. What are your ideas to bring more economic development and investment to District 6? Uh, for, yes, um, for South Oxnard, I have met in the past with a city manager. Um, it was the neighborhood council and myself who met with him in regards to the Sokolo project that is being talked about. I also have contacted a local businesses and the main challenge that they encounter is their license. The license that they pay to the city is almost $5,000 a year. And I'm talking to small businesses. Yes, um, we, we um, have to bring more businesses, but let's help those who are thriving in South Oxnard. Let's find ways, alternative ways to enhance those businesses and to bring more new businesses into the area, especially, you know, all the way in Saviors, uh, Carl Giesler, there is a small corridor with businesses that they have the same issue. We need me road. All of those businesses are thriving, especially during this um, tough situation of the COVID-19. So they got to be some 30 seconds. Thank you. That's all that I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ramirez. I think first and foremost, we support local businesses. South Oxnard people are resourceful and they're not afraid to hustle. Unfortunately, a lot of these hustles are often criminalized, such as street vending or folks who sell flowers, and um, most visibly folks who sell food, food vendors. Um, there's a great source of funds available here if we would just take the time to look at how we can work um, to take these opportunities uh, and empower people. I'm a little disappointed that the city um, had an opportunity to kind of look into people selling food from their houses, but they did not, um, they did not agree to it or they did not even really speak at a general city council meeting about it to let folks know about it. Uh, so I think that there are a lot of already resources that we can latch onto and jump on with. We just need to be open and creative. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lopez. Thank you. I want to make clear uh, one of the points in terms of the development and the conversations that did begin last year uh, about the de econo ec economic development for South Oxnard. And it started with a series of meetings that I par participated in with our city staff to look at how we can bring some much needed attention to the Saviors Ro Road business corridor. Out of those conversations with the three largest commercial business owners in South Oxnard along Saviors, there, there was a mutual interest in creating a public open space that has been uh, called the Socalo. And I have been a proud supporter and leading this effort to ensure that we can bring this to our city and support the businesses in this area. But from these conversations as well, we have begun the process to explore the uh, formation of a business improvement district that will be focused on developing and improving the conditions of Saviors Road to ensure that businesses continue coming seconds. here and supporting our residents. And through this pandemic, as a, a board member on the Economic Development Collaborative, the, uh, the organization has supported 822 businesses in Oxnard to ensure that they are able to continue working during the pandemic. So there are already efforts on the way and we are going to continue working on these in the next four years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question will be taken by Ms. Yolanda Solorio, and the order will be Ms. Ramirez, followed by Ms. Lopez, followed by Ms. Gallardo Magaña. Yes, hello. Uh, my question is, of the five local ballot measures, which do you support and which do you oppose? Ms. Ramirez? Yes, sorry, it takes a little time to unmute. Um, that's a good question. I think that before we even speak on the ballot measures um, on a personal level, I, I do understand and I do realize uh, how taxes can be helpful in order to fund programs that benefit people. But I also know that Oxnard needs more accountability and I do see and read what folks say and how they feel and they're very divided especially on measure e 
And that's a little concerning. And on a personal level, I, I can see both sides. And I think that more so than anything, we need to strive for more accountability somehow in Oxnard, more visibility of where our money goes, uh, what it is being used for. Um, more so than anything, I can say I support holding the city accountable. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lopez? Yes, thank you. So in terms of the uh, five ballot measures that we will, are going to see in the coming week as we all receive our ballots, I am not supportive of measure F, L, M, and N. I am supportive of measure E because we have a lot of need in our city. We had a very challenging budget cycle last year where we were forced to take a very unfortunate action as a council uh, when it came to employees, when it came to services, that is very visible right now. It, you can see it in our parks, you can see it in the roads, and, you, and we don't need to continue the threat on the emergency response and services to our residents. So we need this measure to support the services that are, that are very much needed, more so now with this pandemic than ever before. And this is the area that we can really take control to ensure that come January or February, when we see a, a mid-year evaluation of our budget, our city budget, we won't be forced to take further seconds. cuts and support and actually support our city staff and our residents with the services that they need and to keep our city running at a higher level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, hello. Um, you know, it's a lot of information to be observed. And um, so um, I would say, you know, um, that measure E is very vague. Um, and I just hope the residents make the right decision when voting. And um, that's all that I have to say. The city has to be uh, accountable for, um, you know, all of that taxes that they are planning to increase and we need clear accountabilities and there is no time limit for this uh, measure. So um, I just hope the residents make the right decision when voting. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Our next question will be asked by Ms. Alejandra Valencia and the order will be Ms. Lopez followed by Ms. Gallardo Magaña followed by Ms. Ramirez. So the next question would be, what do you think needs to be done to fully address homelessness in the city? Thank you. The homelessness uh, issue is something that we have been discussing for quite some time. We have been in the process as a city to identify a permanent location for a homeless shelter. We currently have a, a shelter that was not intended to be a year round uh, center. It was not intended to be uh, operating at the level that, that it has been. And that is why we are moving forward. And we recently took action to set, to set up a, a navigation center that will serve more than a homeless shelter to provide the needed services when it comes to health, when it comes to mental health, um, to those that, that are, are unfortunately living, uh, living in, in our streets. I had the opportunity to participate in the annual point in time count earlier this year, where I spent the morning time walking around the South Oxnard, taking note and surveying those individuals that have been living on the street to identify the number of people. We have seen an increase in homeless people in the area, specifically 567 people that were counted this year alone. So the services through the navigation center are those that, that will help to transition those, uh, those homeless people out of the, the, the system and into more permanent housing. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Okay, um, you know, living in South Oxnard, um, I do see um, um, we have a lot of homeless people, in, especially in Ormond Beach in the Lagoon. We have to um, find better ways to take care of them, to allocate them so they can have a safe place where to um, sleep, where to have a hot meal. Personally, I have been around uh, hang, um, giving them food um, and I have served, I would say like three or 400 in the past two months. I go around every morning, I do give them food because that's all that I can do for now. 
but once in the, in the chair, I have to find alternative ways to better serve that community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallardo. So homelessness is a very complex issue. In order to talk about homelessness, uh, yes, we need to address things that help the current homeless folks, but we need to start thinking of ways to address all of that which causes homelessness. And I think that we need to start looking at programs for affordable housing. We need to start looking at food security for all. We need to start really investing in education and resources for jobs. Uh, we need to stop putting band-aids and start with real solutions to this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question will be taken by Mr. David Ebbett and the order will be Ms. Gallardo Magana, followed by Ms. Ramirez, followed by Ms. Lopez. Candidates, there is much national discussion around the defunding and reallocating of police budgets to fund other social services. Likewise, within Oxnard, there has been discussion around OPDs or Oxnard Police Department's funding levels. What are your thoughts on the matter specific to Oxnard? Ms. Magana? Thank you. Um, you know, first of all, we have to make sure that our residents feel comfortable and feel safe around the police. Uh, also, we have to um, find ways where the, where the department provides services much needed in our city. Perhaps um, checking out their um, call record um, calls, like for example, if we have a lot of uh, calls for domestic violence, implementing services for that uh, those people. If we have a lot of call about uh, about um, youth. Providing uh, services to the people, I think that will be a best way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ramirez. So we need to understand that crime does not happen in a vacuum. Many folks do not engage in so-called criminal activities just for the thrill of it. Many folks out here are driven because they have no other options or no other resources. So I think that removing money from the inflated police budget and putting it into programs that improve education, improve job opportunities, improve resources for people, it, it is a good step to go. Uh, the answer is not to further criminalize, criminalize and police people, but rather to let them flourish and help them thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lopez. Yes, thank you. Uh, this conversation dis definitely picked up uh, over the last couple of months and one that uh, had initially uh, with initial comments came to the city council. Uh, one that is full of emotion because of the impact uh, that police brutality has on our black and African American Lat and Latino and brown uh, populations and residents. That is why I worked with our mayor pro tem Carmen Ramirez uh, to bring a resolution forward that condemns police brutality and declares racism a health crisis. And I have to mention that our police chiefs were involved in the, the writing of this resolution because they do understand and they are close to our residents and understanding the impact of crime and the need to maintain public safety. But through this, we do need to acknowledge that there's always room for improvement and perhaps evaluating where our police officers are being pulled into and what direction to ensure that the proper services are seconds. reaching our residents and the calls for uh, the emergency calls that come to, to the police department directly. And they are the first ones showing up at, at a incident along with our fire department. So there's definitely a conversation to continue. And I see the willingness of our police department to ensure that our community is protected and working in community policing for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question will be asked by Ms. Yolanda Solorio and the order will be Ms. Ramirez first, followed by Ms. Lopez, followed by Ms. Gallardo Magana. Yes, so the former city bank building in your district was recently proposed to be demolished in favor of a 7-Eleven that was ultimately shut down. 
What would you want to do with this area instead? Ms. Ramirez? Um, that's a really good question. Thank you for it. I do remember hearing about it and being very concerned, um, especially I think it is concerning when we take a look at the vast differences between South Oxnard and North Oxnard. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. I think that, like I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, we don't need any more 7-Elevens. We need cultural spaces. We need spaces where our youth can gather. We need spaces where people can gather. Um, the Sokolo idea that has been mentioned has been a very good idea, actually. Uh, I think that we need to move beyond South Oxnard being this type of industrialized space and we need our own collection. Why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we have that down here? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lopez. Thank you. The, uh, the proposed development, the 7-Eleven proposed development in South Oxnard is just one example of the power in our community to stand up for what we believe in to be a good, positive, contribution to our community and especially South Oxnard. This is just one example throughout the city where our residents are speaking up, are fighting to ensure that we have uh, better services, that we have better development that is contributing and, uh, and in the end going to be a beneficial contribution to our city. The other example is the Fisher Fisherman's Wharf project. Uh, in the Channel Islands Harbor. And you look at these two projects and this is a clear, a clear indication to any developer coming to the city of Oxnard that you need to work with our residents and work with our community to ensure that any project coming here is going to be seconds. a part of us and not just a separation to attract other, uh, other people, um, but being a contribution to our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matanya. Um, Yolanda, can you please repeat the question? Yes, of course. So the former Citibank building in your district was recently proposed to be demolished in favor of a 7-Eleven that was ultimately shut down. What would you want to do with the area instead? I would love to see something cultural, um, so where the, where the people can engage more, uh, perhaps, um, I don't know, a cultural park where we can have something um, there where um, people can go and um, live their culture. Um, that's all that I will say for now. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Our next question is going to be by uh, Ms. Alejandra Valencia and the order will be Ms. Lopez followed by Ms. Gallardo Magaña followed by Ms. Ramirez. Thank you, Gabe. Um, the following question, um, uh, the following concerns or questions have been actually posed by members of the public regarding your candidacy. Um, Ms. Lopez, given you are the incumbent and many residents have expressed frustration with the current council's performance, why do you feel the voters should consider you for a second term? Thank you, that is a, a very appropriate, appropriate question and uh, one that I am very proud uh, to first have been elected two years ago to serve our residents. And uh, I think the criticism or opinion of our council is, is much more complicated. There are a lot of issues that we can uh, work on that we can get into uh, as, a, as a local jurisdiction. And there are others that are, that are out of our, our control. But I'm very proud of the work that we have been able to, to do in the last, uh, in less than two years to ensure that we are improving the, uh, the transparency, the uh, governance of our city. And it has been through measures of implementing systems that will allow a streamlined process, both for uh, business, uh, business permits, uh, the way that our city functions with a, a system uh, that will go a longer way. So uh, as I continue to, to mention these, uh, that is why I want to continue serving our residents of Oxnard seconds. because there is much more work to do and the experience that I bring having worked in public service and the trust that I have been given by many in many residents in South Oxnard as well as the entire city and organizations 
that are looking to ensure that Oxnard is thriving. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Uh, Ms. Ramirez, some have stated a perception that you are new to local politics and have not been as visibly involved in the community. What is your response to this? I think that for many of us, and I say many of us because it is not just me, that have been involved in more local grassroots organizations, our, our work is often underlooked and undermined. Um, I know that when I was in Topo that I worked locally with victims of police brutality. Um, we were actually one of the first groups here back in 2016, 2017 to recommend a civilian oversight committee to the city council. Um, I worked with the local apartment complexes to form tenants unions. Um, so a lot of us are working hard and we're working locally, but just because we are not visible, just because we don't hold uh, large public platforms, doesn't mean that we're not out here doing something. Um, and I think that it is very unfair to judge some of us just because some folks have not heard of us or have not seen seconds. us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. Um, Ms. Gallardo, you ran for council before, and even though it can be said that you are very visible and active in the community, um, did not get elected. What accomplishments can you point to that would earn the votes of those who did not vote for you last time? Thank you. That's a very good question. Like I mentioned before, um, in the past two years, since 2018 to the present, I have been very active in the community, um, not just listening to the residents, but also, like I mentioned before, I am working on the beautification of the Schumas Creek Canal, better known as JS Street. This is in, in collaboration with the county. I am also, um, I, I am the co-creator of a park on Cuesta del Mar, which will bring um, programs to the youth, the kids, and like I said it before, to the señoras, with the respect they deserve. Also, um, we, have, we installed the air quality monitor at Haycox Elementary School. This one was supposed to be installed at San, no, Winimi Elementary School on, Winimi, on Ventura Road, but we advocated for that to be transferred to Haycox and we got it at Haycox. And why at Haycox? It's because we have the uh, toxic sites right there. We have Halaco, we have the power plants, we have the fields. So that's what I accomplished. And then also um, I advocated for- 20, the, 20 seconds, Ms. Cairo. Okay, fire engine 62 to be kept at station number two on Pleasant Valley. I also have gotten grants for the betterment and for the benefit of the residents and many, many other projects that I, I don't have the time to mention them right now, right now and not mentioning the food pantry since 2017. I have accomplished that and I can do- Your time has expired, Ms. Cayano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Mr. David Ebbett and the order will be Ms. Gallardo Magaña followed by Ms. Ramirez, followed by Ms. Lopez. Candidates, it has been said that sometimes candidates only show up during election time. Then they disappear after the election only to reappear for the next election. If you don't get elected, what are you planning to do to continue helping out in our community? No doubt, like uh, you guys have seen and being very involved, even though I was not elected in 2018, uh, people can see me out there uh, and I don't post everything that I do. I do weekly sweepings in my neighborhood in surrounding areas. So I, I will keep doing what I love to do and that is helping people and advocating for people. So I will keep doing what I have done up until now and maybe even more, who knows what life can bring. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ramirez. I would say that I would be doing the same things I have been doing and the things that I am doing. Um, I will continue raising funds for at-risk youth here in Oxnard and South Oxnard specifically. I will continue working closely with some of the families that I personally work with, uh, some of the folks that I personally work with um, to tackle 
just struggles of marginalized communities. I will continue on my research, uh, my education, which will further help me uh, find creative solutions to come up with, um, to solve problems here in my city. And win or lose, we're still going to be out here. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Lopez. Thank you. Well, certainly it's, it's ironic that, uh, you know, when we don't post something on social media, it appears that we are not present and not doing anything, but uh, that is quite the opposite. Uh, there is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of work that goes on that is not visible to the public, uh, but we are, are working every day for our community. So I don't see that uh, this, this election, regardless of the results, will keep me away from continuing to serve through, uh, through locally, through organizations that I've been involved in as a board member of Future Leaders of America that serves our, our youth. That is something that I, I will continue doing, um, as well as uh, the opportunities that have come up through this pandemic to volunteer and serve so many community members, not just in Oxnard, but in Ventura County through food distributions uh, and, and supporting other efforts uh, that will in the long run benefit everyone here in the greater community of Oxnard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Our next question will be asked by Ms. Yolanda Solorio and the order will be Ms. Ramirez, followed by Ms. Lopez, followed by Ms. Gallardo Magaña. Yes, so the question is, in the 2019-2020 fiscal year, the City Council was facing a 9.2 million structural deficit. FEMA programming cuts had to be made to close this deficit. What do you think we need to do to bring the city back to the desired service level? Uh, Ms. Ramirez? I think that, like I've mentioned before, we need accountability, we need visibility, we need transparency when it comes especially to money and how the city is using it. I think that we need to think smart. I think that we need to start looking at things that the city overspends in and see if maybe we can use that money for something else. Um, like I've said, for example, yes, the police department, I do believe that we can take funds from there and use them for, quite frankly, for better things. I think that the city needs to be more congruent and just start talking to folks about what happens with the money that we put in. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Thank you. Having gone through the 1920 budget cycle year, it, uh, it was very tough and it was very challenging. It was a very emotional decision to take. And that is something that you think about what would that have looked like if we, uh, if we hadn't uh, taken a hard decisions and looking at the current status of our entire nation and how the, the pandemic has impacted us locally. So while those decisions were very hard, it is something that uh, we have an opportunity now through Measure E to bring back the services and bring back the investment in our youth and our infrastructure and our streets and our medians, our parks, every corner of our city that you see. And this measure will help us to do that. If we don't have this measure, then you, we will have very, very challenging uh, conversations uh, come January. Our budget is already to the bone. We have, we have cut where we can, seconds. our reserves are at a, a, a low level below the, the percentage, the 12% a goal that we should have. So there are very tough challenges ahead if we don't take action in this election. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Magoya. Um, I, I will ask you to please repeat that question again. Yes, of course. In the 2019-2020 fiscal year, the city council was facing a 9.2 million structural deficit. Painful programming cuts had to be made to close this deficit. What do you think we need to do to bring the city back to the desired service level? I would say that um, as a city council, we have to look for alternatives, ways to um, make, uh, bring more businesses to the city. Um, so that would bring more revenues, perhaps um, 
we have to develop more South Oxnard. South Oxnard hasn't been developed in a long time. And we have the gem right there. Like I said, we have the Ormond Beach. Um, right? So if we clean up Ormond Beach and we advertise it, it's a touristic place and that can bring more revenues to the city. Um, there are many other ways to find, uh, to bring money into the city. Thank you very much. At this point, uh, we have time for one last question. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to our question and answer box that um, allows the uh, attendees to ask some things. And um, I'm just, we only have time for one. And so I'm going to try and get one that uh, would be uh, a little bit more universal for each of our candidates. And the question comes from Mr. Richard Tucker. And the question is, what do you see as the most pressing issues facing Oxnard in the near future? And how would you approach those issues? The order for this will be Ms. Lopez, followed by Ms. Gallardo Magaña, followed by Ms. Ramirez. Ms. Lopez. Thank you. The, there's definitely very pressing issues um, that are, are, are coming up ahead. And, and specifically, as we have talked about, the budget is one that uh, will be a very challenging uh, a challenging process. Um, the budget, our housing uh, situation in our city, uh, where we need more housing, we need better housing for our working families, our farm workers. And when you look at these two, uh, we do need to focus on uh, bringing jobs and increasing the opportunity for our residents to work in places here in Oxnard, uh, to work in places of employment that are, that are within our home, within our, within our cities. Uh, city's boundaries to ensure that the companies that are coming here that are investing in, in development in our city are going to stay here and are going to serve the needs of, the needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Gallardo Magaña. Uh, yes, I will ask you to please repeat the question. Yes, of course. The question is, what do you see as the most pressing issues facing Oxnard in the near future and how would you approach those issues? Definitely the budget is the biggest one, I would say. And um, we have to work together in collaboration to find ways, like I said it before, to bring more revenues to the city. Uh, another big challenge that I see is that our homeless population, we have to find um, ways to help them better. We have to find ways to bring more funds into the city and more programs for youth and for homeless. And, and we also have to look at for our veterans population. But I would say the biggest challenge is the budget and the, and the homeless population. Thank you very much. Ms. Ramirez. So the compañeras brought up very good points and maybe I am a bit biased because I work with kids, but I do see that a pressing priority right now in Oxnard, which will affect us long term, is something that we are being affected by due to COVID-19, and that is the education that our youth is receiving. As a student myself, and as someone who takes care of kids, and I see them struggling every day with uh, online learning, I think that it is something that this city has not addressed. Uh, we have not really talked about it. And there are many families, many kids who are struggling and many kids who are going to be left behind. And this is going to affect us in our future because if we have youth that is being left behind, then what hope do we have when they grow? And it is something that I wish would get talked about more. I wish that schools out here would be more transparent in the struggles that they've been facing so that we can start seeing what we need to do 30 seconds. to correct this. Thank you. Thank you very much. This will conclude our question and answers portion. We're now going to move into closing statements. And again, we will have two minutes for closing statements and each candidate will um, be able to speak for that duration. And the order of this will be Ms. Gallardo Magaña, followed by Ms. Ramirez, followed by Ms. Lopez. Ms. Ma uh, Gallardo Magaña, you have two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I just want to remind residents that soon they will be receiving their uh, ballot in the mail. And do not forget that we have two in-person voting places in South Oxnard. One of them is Winnie High School in Oxnard College. 
Also, booths will be open as early as October 31st until election day. And don't forget to vote for Carolina Gallardo Magaña as your representative. I will keep advocating for the betterment of South Oxnard. I will advocate for the farm workers, for our veteran population, our special needs, our homeless population. I will find ways to keep individuals from entering that toxic site of Halako. I will keep cleaning Ormond Beach uh, whenever possible. And then um, I will keep doing what I do. And that is serving people, bringing uh, programs to South Oxnard and this in collaboration with other organizations for sure because one person can't do it by, by itself but, by, but i can do it in collaboration with others so if you want more information about me about my campaign uh, please visit carolinaforoxnard.com or my facebook page carolina gallardo magaña for council uh, if you need a loan sign please send me a message and i will drop it off to your house and don't forget I, uh, I came to this country with empty pockets and full of dream. I am a woman of color. I am indigenous. I am a farm worker. I own my businesses in South Oxford District 6. I own properties in South Oxford District 6. I have invested in South Oxnard like no one else have done. So let's keep doing it. Si se puede, señores. Votemos noviembre 3. Carolina Gallardo Magaña, su mejor opción. Gracias. Thank you very much. Ms. Ramirez, you have two minutes. I believe in Oxnard. All my life I have heard people say that they cannot wait to leave. Staying in your hometown is often looked on negatively. It is associated with failure and getting left behind. But I believe in Oxnard. I believe that the way we speak about the place we grew up in is a direct representation of how we view ourselves. I believe in Oxnard because I believe in myself. I believe in the people. I believe that within each and every single one of us lies the capability of building each other up and simultaneously building up our community. It is because of this that whatever happens in November does not concern me. Winning, losing, whatever will happen on November 3rd will not change anything. I have step-by-step step put in work in my community and for my people. Win or lose, I will continue to do so. Building up our community, empowering people, fighting for transformative change, these are all things that do not begin or end solely with a ballot or an I voted sticker. Mutual aid, taking care of one another and fighting to improve our conditions is something that is done every day at all times. If I am given the opportunity to hold a seat in city council, I will see you in the council chambers. If not, then I look forward to seeing you in the streets as we continue striving towards autonomy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Lopez, you have two minutes. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in tonight and thank you to the INCO and the planning committee for putting on this forum. I also wanna take an opportunity to thank all my family and friends who are watching right now for your incredible support, not just in this, uh, this campaign for reelection to city council, but in my previous uh, engagements and campaigns for the Wainimi Elementary School District where I have uh, served and learned about the, the education system, especially those that serve our families in South Oxnard. As a council member, I have approached this responsibility with care and attention because it is important to me to listen and make decisions that are informed and are in the best interest of all our Oxnard residents. As an immigrant, someone who arrived in this country at the age of four, this is much more important for me as someone who has been raised and continues as I continue to live in this neighborhood and in, in the Redwood neighborhood. This is important for me to be a voice for our residents, not just in South Oxnard, for our, but our entire city. I have earned a broad support of essential workers that include those workers, employees in our city, firefighters, working families, labor unions, the Ventura County Democrat, Democratic Party, and three of the four active council, the neighborhood council district chairs in district six. This is a testament to my ability to work with others, to the experience that I can bring to collaborate with a variety of groups and how we can better our community in South Oxnard. 
This is a testament to the trust that people have placed in me and that I hope to also earn your vote in this coming election. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank all of our candidates for coming out tonight. And I invite our audience attendees and those watching to please give you all a round of applause. Uh, this is not easy to do and it's um, great to have you come out and do this for the benefit of the public and as we come up with our election, a very important election on November 3rd, 2020. So thank you all again and I want to um, ask each of you, we've asked each of our candidates for each forum, any questions that we did not get to this evening, uh, would you be open to us sending them to you uh, for a written response back to us and we'll post it um, online for the public to review? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. yes. Great, thank you all very much. So with that, this concludes our evening tonight for Districts 3, District 4, and District 6. I thank all of you for coming out and viewing it. If you stayed for the entire three hours, well, maybe you can join the planning group next time if you're willing to sit through that. Thank you so much. And I thank all of our candidates. This is such important information for the public to be able to see and hear. And I also want to uh, remind folks that tomorrow will be our fourth of four forums. It will be at six o'clock starting at, starting at six. It will be the same link if you had signed up already before. And tomorrow evening, we will be having an introductory few minutes from the uh, city clerk candidate who is running unopposed. And then we will have a um, forum for the two candidates running for city treasurer. So tomorrow night, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. And uh, the city has also committed to posting this video from tonight onto the city's YouTube page and putting it into the rotation of their programming that happens on the TV channels for the city. So anyone without internet can still have access to seeing these, uh, these forums as well. Thank you all again so much for a wonderful evening and for all of your work and your efforts. And we will see you all tomorrow as well. Have a good evening. Thank you and good night candidates. Thank you. Good night, everyone.